Let's get right into it, guys. This week's podcast is going to be specifically just about stand-up comedy. So if you have no interest in this, just uh, turn this off and you know tune in next week. But I get so many emails, so many questions from fans about how to get into stand-up comedy, you know, young bucks trying to get in this business. And then also, I'm doing this because also in town, in town in L.A., many times I get approached by young comics, open micers or newcomers, these, you know, these new jacks who come into town, and they all say the same thing. They end up, you know, we talk a little bit, and then they end up walking up to me and approaching me, and then they'll go, hey, Elliot, you know, um, I'd love to take you out for a coffee sometime and, you know, just pick your brain. You know, it always ends with that sentence, like, pick your brain. I'd love to, like, you know, buy you a drink or, dude, we should grab some food sometime. And, you know, I'd love to pick your brain, you know. And basically what they're doing is they're asking for me for advice, which is totally cool. I totally understand that. Like, that's what you should be doing. When you're new in this game, do not be afraid to ask the question. The worst thing that's going to happen is a person is going to say no, all right? Uh, don't be pushy about it, but that's how you learn. You have to learn from people who've done it before you. It can save you a lot of time. You know, I wish I did that. When I started in this business, um, there was two things working against me. One, I was really, really shy. You know, I was very introverted. I was in New York City, and you know, because I didn't want to impose on people. I didn't want to feel like I was being pushy. Also, at the time, no one was really willing to help me. On top of that, you know, um, whether it was me, uh, it could have been a combination of things. Maybe. Uh, I felt like people were kind of standoffish, but maybe it's because I was standoffish. So maybe it was a reflection of what I was putting out there. But I just felt like no one really wanted me to do well or was looking to help me out. So I totally get it if you want to ask for advice. But this is the thing, you know, the advice uh, people are asking is pretty much the same. And, you know, uh, I've had a I've had a rule of thumb for a very long time. I've had this philosophy for a long time that. I remember long ago when I started in this business, I said to myself, you know, no one's helping me out. Come a day, I'm in a position to help someone. If they ask me for help, I will give it. And if they try to thank me, I'll just say, I don't want any thanks. Don't even thank me. What I want is that someday you'll be in the position to help someone beneath you. And all I ask is when they ask for that help, you give it willingly, unselfishly without asking for anything in return. It's just karma. Just spread the karma, good karma, you know, just pass it on. That's all, you know, that's all I want. Do not say thank you, you know. Um, But this is the thing, though. Uh, So when I've done that, you know, here and there it happens. I'd say it happens like a couple times a year, uh, maybe like once every other month or something. So I'll meet some guy at a show and be like, hey, you know, I'd love to pick your brain. Um, And what ends up happening is when I end up talking to him, it's, it's about an hour conversation. And it's the same hour conversation, and it's really exhausting. Actually, it's just it's just exhausting for me to talk about something over and over again. It's almost you know it's almost like you're performing. It's almost like you're reading the same script over and over again. And of course, to that person, I completely understand. To that person, it's an original question to them. It's a new question. It's a new topic. But for me, being in the game for so long, it's not. You know, for me, it's just like, dude, I'm getting exhausted. But I still want to help people. You know, I don't mind you know, sending the help out there, but it's just getting time consuming. I just don't have the time anymore. So now I decided, you know what? I have this podcast. I should do one entire episode about how to help someone if they're starting out in stand-up comedy, what you need to do. And this way, if someone ever asks me, I'll be like, listen, just tune into episode whatever it is. You know, it's going to be called like Comedy for Dummies or whatever I title this. Check that episode out. If you have any questions beyond that, then you can talk to me after that. You know, uh, I'm, I'm totally down to hang out. I don't mind that at all, but I just, I just don't want to talk shop. It's just exhausting, okay? And also, I'll tell you another thing. This is not everyone across the board. So I don't want anyone to, I don't want anyone who I've talked to to assume this is what I think about them because it's not everyone across the board. But a lot of times when young comics are asking me for help, you know, basically what they're really looking for is a hookup. You know, what they really are asking me for is a shortcut. You know, so when someone says, hey, so, you know, um, you know, I've been trying to get representation. Like, how do I go about doing that? Really, what they're saying is, how do you get me an agent? You know, like, how did you get me? How did you get an agent? And you know what? Can you hook me up with an introduction? And again, you know what? That's exactly what you should be doing. When you come into town, if you're an actor or a musician or a comedian, like, I mean, think about it. If you don't ask, how are you going to get it? You know? But the thing is, I'm just saying from my point of view, when it's done to you dozens and dozens of times, it's just exhausting to be like, listen, I, I can't introduce every person who asks to an agent. I can't, you know? People ask me like, hey, who's your booker? Can you can you get me an in? And I'm like, listen, I'll do, I try to do so here and there when I, I try to help people out. But I can only send so many people to the same agent, manager, or booker. You know, I mean, if I just keep sending them people every day, they're like, dude, what the hell? You know, first of all, 
then there really is no, you know, it, there's no, there's nothing special to it. Because if I'm sending, you know, tons of people over to a booking agent every every week, it's just like, really, is every single person you meet fantastic? You know, compared to if I just hold up and I'm like, you know what? Once or twice a year, I'll second, I'll send a recommendation or a referral over to my agent, and they'll really give it some consideration. You know, all right. So let's get into it. So if you're a stand-up comic and you're looking to get into this business, or if you're just interested, this is a good this is a good episode. If you're just interested in how this goes down behind the scenes, how do you become a stand-up comic? What do people have to go through? Because a lot of people that's another thing. A lot of people do not respect comedy because they think it's just so easy to become a comic, and it's not. People think you just get up on stage and tell jokes. That's like the worst thing. The way people treat me sometimes, um, and this is not across the board. A lot of times I meet people who have common sense and they realize like, hey, this must, you know, you must be some kind of artist some way, you know, you must have a craft that you hone and they respect that. You know, they really appreciate it. I do an hour of comedy and I walk off and the way they thank me really shows that they get it. They're like, hey, thanks. That was great. I, I you know, I had a great time. I feel better, you know, uh, but then some people are like, oh, you know, tell me a joke. And when so- anytime someone's like, tell me a joke. When they treat me like a dancing monkey, then I, I know they have completely no respect for what I do. I understand why they would see it that way because they don't know. How would you know? But it's just ridiculous, you know? So, like, that's like me coming up to a cop and say, show me your gun. Just, just, just hand it over to me. Like that, cop, like, you know, like, that cop has, you know, no training whatsoever, that he's not someone to be respected. It's like, yeah, just give me your gun. They give out guns all the time, right? So when someone's like, yeah, oh, you're a comic? Tell me a joke. I, you know, I, it takes everything in my power to hold myself back just from saying like you know what why don't you go fuck yourself and your mother too all right so uh first thing to do if you're a stand-up comic or trying to or you're trying your you know looking into this business get on stage right now as soon as possible okay i don't care if you have nothing prepared just get to an open mic somehow just get on stage sign up and get on stage that is the most important step of your entire career because the majority of you will finally get on stage a year after you decide i think i want to try that because you procrastinate you chicken out you make excuses and i'm telling you the first time you get on stage it's a snowball effect once you finally get on stage it'll make you eager to getting on stage again and again and again and that's the only way to get better getting on stage i can't stand when I talk to some new comic who's like, yeah, I've been spending a lot of time writing. I've been sent, you know, and I'm like, really? How, how, how much time? Like, I've been writing for like three or four months. And I'm like, dude, that is a complete waste of time. Okay? If you are just writing, that's useless. Okay? Because you're brand new. You don't even know how to write yet. Okay? If you're trying to become, if you're trying to become a comic writer just for paper to hand in scripts, then yeah, spend a lot of time writing. That totally makes sense. But you're not trying to be a writer. You're trying to be a performer. Okay, you need to get on stage because this is the thing. In the beginning, at least for me, so when you're writing, I would say in the beginning, I would say when I would write, twenty percent of what I would write would actually end up working on stage. Would actually end up being funny, and the rest of it was just like dog shit. All right, and you won't know that. Unless you get on stage. Like, you can't test out material in your head by writing it and reading it. You have to get on stage. So, when someone's like, Yeah, I've been writing for four months, I'm like, You've wasted four months of time. Okay? Because if you had you gotten on stage that first day four months ago, you would have realized how quickly, you know, you, real quickly, you'd have realized how much time you wasted writing because you would work stuff out on stage. I'm like, Oh my God, everything I wrote this week, one joke was good and the rest was horseshit. All right. So get on stage. I'm telling you, I cannot stand when someone's like, I've been writing. You know, go fuck yourself and you're writing. You are a fucking scared little baby. That's what you're doing. You're hiding behind your writing. Writing is nothing. Okay. There's theory and practice. Get on stage. Okay. When you get on stage, record everything. Every camera phone, cell phone, every phone can either audio record or video record. Okay. If you can't get someone to hold the camera and video record, audio record so many people do not record themselves and so many times they are misguessing what is funny because their memory is different from reality and when you listen to the audio you go that's when everyone laughed at that joke not this joke all right so many people come off the stage i can't believe how many times i've heard someone like oh man i killed and i'm like killed what reality apparently because you fucking suck gorilla balls dude that was awful you know where, where did you hear the laughter you know but once I started recording myself and I realized, like, wow, like, that was funny. People laugh where I didn't expect them to laugh. 
And it teaches you what about yourself is funny. Because you can't perceive yourself the way other people do. And you know what? You don't have to videotape yourself every single time, but definitely do it every now and then because it's really important. Because in the beginning, you won't realize the ticks that you have. I can't stand people who are constantly pacing, um, constantly fiddling with their hair, their jacket, their glasses, their tie. You don't realize what you're doing because you're not watching yourself. All right. Now, where to find open mics, where to find spots. That's another thing. A lot of open micers be like, hey, Elliot, where do you recommend I get on stage? And a lot of times I'm like, dude, I'm not trying to sound cocky. I'm not trying to sound like you know I'm above you. But honestly, dude, like where you would get on stage as an open micer is so different from where I would get on stage. And I don't even know. I, I haven't been at the open mic level for like a decade. Like I don't even know where open mics are. You would have to find out. The best way to find out, you'll find one. Go online, go on Facebook, Google it online, you know, wherever, whatever city you're in, just Google open mic comedy, you know, Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, whatever. You'll find one. Go to that one. When you're there, talk to other comics. Introduce yourselves. You know, if, if a lot of people are like, how do I introduce myself? Even if it's as simple as someone gets off the stage, you just walk up to them like, hey, man, I, th- I really dug your set. What's your name? Hey, my name's so-and-so. And then just start hanging out. So, within a couple of months of hanging out and talking to other comics, you will quickly learn where the other open mics are because everyone's just like, yeah, I'm going I'm to head off to this open mic now. And you're like, oh, let me come along. Or if not, come along. Like, oh, I'll meet you there, you know? I'm telling you, if you go out every night, there's an open in every city. There's an open mic every single night. All right, just go out, hang out. Within two months, you will know all in the city where you can get on every single night. And again, get on stage. You have to get on stage every night. You can't be like, I'll do it like once every few weeks. You will lose everything that you learn from the night before. You need to get on stage every single night. Okay, just like athletes. Athletes don't just like you know practice you know have a team practice like the day before a game they train and train and train like do you want to be good at what you do you got to train now this is one of the biggest mistakes i see comics do for anyone who doesn't know there are open mic shows and then there are bringer shows the difference is this an open mic means you can just walk in anywhere sign up or pay three bucks or whatever if they charge for it and you go up and you do like three or four minutes for free okay or for a couple of bucks a bringer show means you're going to and, and when you do an open mic audience, you know, most of the time, the majority of the audience, almost 90 percent of that audience is other comedians waiting to go on and a few other people who happen to walk off the street. Now, when you do a bringer show, that means it's a show where you've been required to bring four to ten people or more. And because you brought people, you get to do like, you know, six minutes in front of like a real audience because that entire audience is made up of friends of other comics who are also on the same show. Now, uh, bringer shows usually suck. Uh, I mean, as a comic, it's a great opportunity for you. For the audience, it sucks because it's a bunch of new people. But this is the thing. Um, Too many people will bring like 50 of their friends. And I'm like, dude, are you out of your mind? First rule of thumb, when you first start doing stand-up comedy, don't tell anyone you're doing it because you're going to suck for like a year. You know, it's going to take you a while to figure out how to be funny. And why bring 50 of your friends to watch you bomb? All right. Second thing, the reason you don't want to do that, you've burned your book. Meaning, if you invite every person you know, you'll never be able to do another bringer show for like another year. Because bring like, you know, I mean, bring like four people. Like, let's say you have like 20 friends. Bring four people to each bringer show. That means you can get five shows out of that group of people. If you bring them all the first time, they're not going to come back to watch you do the same jokes again the week after. That's ridiculous. You don't need to bring 20 people, okay? And also the last reason, when you fill an audience full of your friends, it will give you false confidence because your friends are laughing not at your jokes, but they're laughing because they're so supportive and they're just so excited to see you on stage that they'll laugh at anything. They will literally laugh at anything. Also, your friends know you, so they know your personality a little bit more than the audience, so they'll just laugh at you know you because they know you as a person. You know, So that's not a real audience. And you walk out like, man, I killed. It's like, yeah, you killed for friends. But the next time you go back, and it's a room full of strangers, you're going to suck big King Kong monkey balls, all right? Um, so just just keep that in mind. Spread it out. It's okay to bomb in front of three or four people because they won't mind because they'll be like, hey, we're so happy that you got on stage, you know? Um, and also, when you do open mics, you know, don't worry about the open mic being full of 
you know, don't worry about the open mic audience being full of comics. I know a lot of people are like, God, I hate doing open mics. I want to do more bringers, you know, because the comedians don't laugh. They're just watching, judging me, or they're worried about their own material. A lot of times I look out in the audience and the comedian is looking at their own notes because they're on next. Listen, when you get on stage for the first time, do not concentrate on getting laughs. Okay, it's about getting comfortable on stage. You're not going to get laughs. I'm telling you. It's it, you're going to suck in the beginning. It's growing pains, okay? That is the rite of passage we all have to go through. You have to walk over the coals. You have to get thick skin. You have to get comfortable bombing, all right? And because cuz um this and this is a great point cuz it's weird to say this comedy is not about getting laughs. Laughs is a part of the process. Being funny is about being yourself. What is it about you that is funny? What is it about your personality? What is it about your opinions? What is it about your intelligence, your thought process? Okay, Don't concentrate on getting laughs. Concentrate on expressing yourself, showing the audience who you are. Because if you are more focused on writing jokes that work, you know, there are people who just write jokes, structure the jokes, where it's like, well, this isn't about my personality. This doesn't express any of my own opinions. I just know this joke will work. You're not contributing anything new to the world. We have comedians all over the place. Every possible opinion is out there. Every possible persona is out there. You know, as long as you are being true to your persona, it's okay to jump in. But if you're not basically, I mean, I was just talking to someone the other night about this. If you're not pouring something new into this river, this river of comedy, what's the point? Okay, you just you just you're just taking up space, all right? concentrate on expressing your real opinions. And the thing is, by the way, I, it might sound like I'm being harsh, but I'm talking from experience because I used to do that. When I was first starting out, I used to write jokes for, for effect. I used to write jokes because I'm like, I, I know this is shocking or this, is, this will be considered edgy. And you know, it wasn't really me. And I would kill. I would destroy. Okay, there was one year I had a 10-minute set that killed wherever I went. It destroyed. I could take that 10 minutes, go to any club, and it destroyed. But I did myself a disservice. Because looking back on that set, I don't do any of those jokes anymore. Looking back on that set, I wasn't expressing myself. None of those people who ever saw me during those first few, first few years of my career, they didn't see Elliot Chang. They just saw jokes. Okay, jokes that anyone could write. And the thing is, if you write jokes strictly with structure and effect in mind, you're not anything unique you're completely interchangeable to anyone else how many times you've seen I'm, I'm i'm just gonna say this how many times have you seen a black comic doing jokes that you're like i feel like i've seen this black comic before on def jam or bet because they're doing all the same delivery all the same cadence all the same jokes all the same humor like black people are one way and white people are like this you know or honestly how many times you've seen asian person do an imitation of their asian mom you know saying something like i don't approve of your lifestyle you know that's that's a horrible asian accent by the way i don't see and you know why because i don't do these asian accents so i don't know how to do them but how many times have you seen that where you're like okay you just kind of tune out like you you know it's a Jewish comic about being Jewish or, you know, a girl talking about dating or it's just something you predictable. You just tune out because you're like, I've seen this before. OK, my goal in every show is to become something unique. And it's the, it's the same word over and over again. It's like you want to be memorable. OK, you want people to walk out of there not saying, oh, I had a good time at that comedy show. You want people going out saying, I want to see that guy again. OK, that guy is who I want. I don't want to, I don't want to go to another comedy show. I want to see that guy. All right. And and that's what you have to decide from yourself. You know, that's that's another because okay, so another thing you have to do for yourself. If you're young in this game, you need to decide what do you want from this business? OK, it's a very hard business. It's a lot of rejection. It's a lot of pain. Um, you're going to feel looked over many, many times. You need to decide what is it that you want? OK. Uh, basically, if you're doing it just for ego, you know, it's it's going to be a hard road. You know, if you're just doing it because you want attention, it's going to be a hard road. If you're doing it, um, you know, just because you want to have something cool to say that you're doing, it's, you know, it's you're not going to last because it's a very difficult business. I mean, sh steel sharpens steel, you know, and I always want to be surrounded by the best in the business because it's about the craft. It's about like, you know, it's two things. Like, yeah, I do enjoy making people laugh. I'm not going to lie about that. It's, you know, and I believe me, I get off on the attention. Who doesn't? I'll, obviously, I'm a human being. It's shallow, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, I love getting approval. I love the attention. It's awesome. But at the core of that, I really love being able to express myself in a way 
that makes people happy. You know, I mean, I could express myself through music. I could express myself another way. But, you know, joy, happiness, laughter, you know, that's something very specific to comedy. And that's why comedy, you know, people are really drawn to it. Everyone is drawn to comedy. You know, we don't all like the same music or the same movies. But no, I don't think I've ever heard someone say, yeah, I, I just don't like stand-up comedy. It just doesn't appeal to me. I just don't like people being funny. I, I've never heard that. All right. So, you know, if you want to do this business because you're like, you know what? I like the way I can express myself. I like making people laugh. You know, that's a great thing. And also, I mean, for me, I'm doing this because I can't imagine not doing this. You know, you have to ask yourself that. You know, could you easily walk away? Once it gets hard, a lot of people, I've known, I mean, believe me, I've known a lot of people in this business I started off with, they quit. They quit like six years in. I'm like, wow, you put in six years into this business and you quit. That means they they didn't really have the burning desire because it all got too hard. I couldn't deal with the rejection. I'm like, what did you expect? You know, I mean, did you think people were just going to hand you a sitcom? Because you have to have a white, hot, burning desire to do this. Otherwise, you won't. You know, I, I said that to myself I, when I first started. I remember I sat down and I, I was seeing how hard this business was. And I remember saying to myself, you know what? I was like, Elliot. I, I literally was like, Elliot, it may take you 10 years to make a dent in this business. 10 years to get on TV for the first time or get a special or do anything significant. Are you willing to accept that? All right. 10 years. Of rejection. Are you willing to accept that? Are you willing to pay your dues? And I remember I took a long, hard look at myself, you know, and I really thought about it. I was like, yeah, I'm willing to do that. That's how much I want to do this. And that is the little voice in my head that all through the first few years of my business, when I was fucking bombing like a motherfucker and no one wanted to give me a chance and I was doing really shitty open mics here and there and not getting really good responses. Every now and then, I'd be like, what am I doing? Should I just quit this? You know, and something inside me was like, no. I heard, I'm, I'm telling you that crazy voice inside, but I heard voice saying, no, Elliot, do not stop. You know, because I said to myself, hey, if you quit, nothing will definitely ever happen. But if you keep going, there's always still a chance. It took me a long, long time, you know, and... Um, and by the way, it, it took me that long because I made a, lo a lot of mistakes that I, some of them I, I went into already about like not getting on stage, you know, as much as you should. I, I took my time in the beginning. I was getting on stage only twice a week, which sounds like a lot to people. But I knew people who got on stage like five times a week, a couple of times a night. Um, you know, like, you know, it's a perfect example. Uh, me and if, if anyone knows uh, Steve Byrne, the comedian, he's got actually he's got a sitcom coming out on TBS called Sullivan and Sons. Great guy, good friend of mine. He and I started around the same time. I think about a year apart. I think he started a year after me. You know, and we had the same manager at one point. And he's a great guy. Same, he's the same great guy he's been since I first met him. You know, but I remember back in the day, that guy was always fucking hustling. He was always on the go. Like I'd be, I'd do a set and then I'd hang out for the rest of the night at that club and he'd be like, yo, I gotta go. And I'd be like, where are you going? He's like, I got a couple other sets tonight. And I remember like, wow, that guy's just killing himself. And I didn't understand it, but he saw it. He saw the writing on the wall. He got up every night, a couple of times a night. And that's why that guy's got two one hour specials on Comedy Central. That's why he got his half hour special like four or five years before I did. That's why he's got a sitcom right now because he made the connections. Um, he crafted, you know, he crafted his act quicker than I did because he got on stage every night and you know he got funnier quicker than I did. And I learned late in, late in my career Years later, I realized what I should be doing, and then I started doing that. I started getting on stage every night. I started networking. I started like meeting people and things. With literally within a year of deciding to step up my game, everything happened. Within a year, I'm telling you, I moved to LA with that mindset of like, I need to get on stage every night. I need to meet people. I need to you know make connections. Within that year, I got my half hour special. I did Chelsea lately, and I did Showtime special. Okay. All within a year period from moving to L.A. with that mindset. It wasn't just about moving to L.A., but it was the mindset of being proactive. You know, And again, if any of this work sounds scary to you, then you should not be in this business. If anything I said intimidates you, you're not going to last. Just If you can't deal with just hearing about the work, you're not going to be able to put the work in. All right, That's just the way it is. You know, I mean, to the victors go the spoils, and to be a victor, you got to put the work in. All right? Um, so, all right, so let's, let's continue. So, let's say you've done everything I'm talking about. Um, what's the next step? All right. 
if you're a comic and you, you've done it for a couple of months or a year, a couple of years, and by the way, just so you know, rule of thumb, it usually takes comedians about four years to be good. Okay, and I'm not saying you're not going to get laughs in your first few years. I'm not saying you're not going to make progress. What I'm saying is, it takes about four years to be good enough to be presentable, presentable to an agent, presentable to do a set on TV where you don't look like an amateur. All right. Every now and then, I've seen an amateur on television, and we can just guess. Like I'll meet, I'll see someone on TV I've never seen before. I'll watch the set, and I'm like, I think this person's been doing stand up for about two years. And then I'll Google them and try to find out, and I'm usually right. You know, I mean, a lot of times at a, at a club, you can see that you can someone get on stage and there's like an energy. There's an energy of nervousness or lack of confidence or they're just not they're just not owning the stage. You know, so I can just tell, like, this person does not know what they're doing, you know. Um, so. All right. So let's say you've been doing it for a couple of years and you want to go to the next level. Everyone, if you're a comedian or any kind of performer, you need to have a good, clear, great YouTube clip of yourself. Okay, how I, I, I meet comics who don't have I'm like, how do you not have a clip of yourself on YouTube? It's YouTube. If someone meets you and you tell them a comedian, the first thing they do when they get home is YouTube you to see, hey, I wonder if that guy I met tonight was funny. All right. And all you need, all you need is a four to five minute clip. That's all you need. Okay, do not put a 15 minute clip up. Don't put an hour clip up because no one's going to watch it. Okay, I do that all the time where even though like, hey, someone could go, well, they'll just watch the first minute and turn off. No. I mean, think about it. Don't we all do that? If someone sends you a clip and it's like 20 minutes, you're like, I'm not watching that, right? You won't even watch it for a minute. If you watch like a four, if someone sends you a clip, it's four minutes, you're like, I'll check this out, okay? Literally, honestly, if you're a strong enough comic, you only need a three-minute clip because by the second minute, person's already decided if they like you or not. They've already decided if they're going to book you in a show. They've already decided if you deserve to go on TV, you know, but have four or five minutes just to show that you can do a four or five-minute clip because basically when you do a TV clip, like, if you do a TV appearance like Jimmy Kimmel or Jimmy Fallon or whatever, like, you do, you need about four to five minutes. They just want to see that you have it, all right? And this is the best advice I can give about that clip. I mean, I see mistakes all the time when people are making clips. Guys, I, I don't know how many times I have to say this. Your clip, you need to have clear audio quality. It has to be a close-up from your head to your waist, Okay, you don't want a clip that's far away. I see so many clips where it's a camera in the back of the room and the person's a blip in the corner. And I'm like, that video is completely useless because even if they have the audio, they need to see what you look like. They need to see your facial expressions. They need to see your body language. All right. So you need from at least from the head to the waist. They want to see clearly what you look like. And um, if you're a comedian, please, when you get on stage, dress as who you really are, okay? If you feel most comfortable in a suit, don't be ashamed of wearing a suit. If you feel most comfortable in a hoodie and jeans, that's fine. But if you're like, you know, if you're a slob kind of guy and that's your persona and your jokes are about being a slob, don't put on a tie, all right? Or if you're, you know, if your joke's about being intelligent and it's very uppity and kind of, you know, bougie, don't wear a t-shirt and jeans just because you're trying to fit in or you look young. Dress as who you really are because you're not going to fool anyone. When they hear your material, they'll know who you are. The only thing is if you dress inappropriately, it'll distract them from your comedy because they'll be like, I can't get over this person. He's wearing a tuxedo and he's talking about pussy. It's weird, you know? And rule of thumb, as a guy, never, never show your arms or your legs. That's a guy. It's just distracting. I don't care if you're in great shape. I don't care if you get ripped arms. Very few people have ever pulled that off without being distracting. To my knowledge, I know Dane Cook did it for his half hour special, but it kind of worked for his persona at that time. He was a young guy. Um, his, you know, his act was very rock and roll. It, it kind of made sense. But if you're an older guy or a younger guy, um, if you, it, it's fun. It works both ways. If you're, if you have really muscularly, muscular defined arms. It's kind of distracting. And if you don't have muscular arms, it's kind of distracting. And as a girl, never show your cleavage or your thighs. Ever. It is distracting. I'm sorry. It is. If you show your cleavage, girls are going to hate you because they're like, oh, look, she thinks she's sexy. And if you show your cleavage to guys, guys are going to be distracted because they're going to be just looking at your boobs. And I know girls think, like, isn't that good, though? If I've got a really great chest, won't people like me? It's like, no. They'll actually think like, oh, this girl's obviously not funny because she's using her body to get our attention, all right? And I'm not saying you can't wear skirts, okay? You can wear skirts, but don't you can't wear club skirts where, you know, it shows off your thighs. So you see what I'm saying? You can wear skirts that go up to your legs or even slit on the side. What I'm saying is you cannot wear fucking Daisy Duke type 
skirts that you know end at the bottom of your butt. It's just too distracting. Okay? You know, that's like, you know, I mean, if you're going to be a singer, be a singer, but don't go up there and start juggling while you're singing. It's distracting. Just do what you're there to do. All right. Now, let's say you've taken all this advice as far as your clips, your persona, getting on stage, your craft, all that stuff. How do you take it to the next level? You're like, I think I'm ready. I have some, I have a product. You know, as a comedian, I'm the, I'm the product and I think my product is good. I stand behind my product. All right. So many comics don't do this, and this is what I feel holds back a lot of comics. Guys and ladies, you need to learn how to network, all right? You need to learn how to schmooze, and I know we all hate doing it. Believe me, I know. I hate the idea of schmoozing. I really do. I've always been this person who said, you know what? I want to get everything as a comedian based on the merit of my talent, Not because I'm kissing ass, not because I'm friends with someone, and I understand that. But guys, do you want to do what's going to work, or do you want to just be right all the time? Okay. And the thing is, learning to network doesn't mean you have to give up your soul. I'm not saying you have to pretend to be someone you're not. All networking is, because this is what I learned. Because look, before I moved to L.A., I didn't know how to network. And that is the thing that held up my career for a long, long time. And you have to realize, guys, networking is part of any business. Okay? Any business, you work in a bank, you work in a law office, you work with cops, networking, okay? And people have this idea of networking and schmoozing that it's like, oh, we'll do lunch. Networking is just being a good human being. It's just making connections. Let's let's call it that, making connections, all right? And this is how you make connections. Just be nice. That's all it is. Be nice. You don't have to talk business the entire time. Every time I meet an agent, you know, I'm just nice. We just talk about whatever. Just talk about what's on our minds. Like, hey, did you watch that game last night? Or, hey, did you see that fight? Or, hey, did you see that show? And you just talk. And at the end of the conversation, this is the only difference. Because think about it. When you make connections, when you network, it's the same thing as making a new friend. When you meet someone at a party, this is the difference, though. At the end of that conversation, on the way out, don't be afraid to go, hey, by the way, do you have a, do you have a business card? Let's keep in touch. That's all it is. That is all it is. It's like, hey, you know what? Um, can I get your business card? You know? Or don't be afraid to say, hey, you know what? Facebook me, or I'll Facebook you later. Okay? Because ironically, you would think Facebook is specifically for social, you know, social things, but in the entertainment industry, Facebook has more and more become totally common for people to contact each other through Facebook. It's become a totally natural way to get in touch with people. I've had many agents, managers, bookers contact me through Facebook. Just go, hey, what's up? Are you available for this? Happens all the time. So don't be afraid. And you know what? But still, don't be afraid. Just say like, hey, can I get that card? You know, whatever. Let's, let's stay in touch. And every time you see that person, the more you see them, the, m- the more comfortable you get. And the more you comfortable you get with them, the more they'll remember you. And that's all it is. That It's the same. You're like, well, I would rather just be able to audition. You are auditioning. Every moment you meet anyone, you're auditioning. You know, and that's the thing. You'll meet someone, and as they get to know you, and they know your true personality. Literally, you know, let's say you meet a director, and they've gotten to know you casually. They're like, you know, I, I think Elliot would be really good with this part. Like, I've hung out with him enough to know like what his personality is like. Like, he he kind of fits his character. That's what an audition is. Okay, the only difference is when you go to an audition, you're auditioning for a perfect stranger. Hello, do your line, goodbye, and you walk out. With networking, you have more opportunities to follow up with that person and, you know, they're more open-minded because they're at a party or a bar or something like that. That's all it is, okay? Uh, Don't be afraid to network, guys. I mean, I I talk to so many comics who they're just so, like, introverted. And I know I used to be like that. They just just hold up in their little room. Um, Even when they're at the club, I've seen comics destroy on stage, which is the perfect opportunity. Anytime you have a great set, guys, if you're an open micer and you had a great set and you killed, that is a perfect opportunity to go around the room and meet every person in the room you haven't met yet because they will want to talk to you. You know, just go up and be like, hey, how's it going? And they'll be like, hey, great set. I'm telling you. Go, oh, thank you very much. And be nice and be genuine. I'm not, again, I'm not talking about faking it. Be genuine. Okay. And this is a great advice for anyone. All right. Um, and, and like I said, so when you meet someone, you get their business card, um, or if you get their full name, always get people's full names, all right? And a couple of days later, add them on Facebook. Do not be afraid to follow up on Facebook. Don't do it the night you get home, because then it looks kind of creepy. You can do it the, the day after or a couple of days after, but within a couple of days, you have to do it within a couple of days, because people meet people every day, 
okay, girls meet guys all the time, guys meet girls all the time in business or social. You're, you're always meeting people and you forget people. If they don't add you on Facebook, you will quickly forget that you met that person, okay? And by the way, this is my rule of thumb when it comes to networking, okay? I'm nice to everyone, all right? There are people who specifically network by only being nice to people that know only being nice to people that they know will help them in the future. That is not the way to network, okay? That's a bad habit to get into because I'm telling you, this is going to happen. I guarantee one day if you get into the habit of only treating people nice because they can help you, one day you're going to be mean or rude to the wrong person because you didn't know who they were. I am nice to everyone because especially in Hollywood, you never know who you're talking to. So many times I've talked to someone, got to know them over time and didn't even know who they were. I just saw them at the same place at the, you know, where it's a Hollywood improv. You see a familiar face all the time. You get to talking to them. I never bring up business, you know, because they know I'm a comic, so I don't have to say that. And there are so many times afterwards, like, oh, do you know who that is? And I'm like, no, who is that? She's like, that's the girl who books the show. And I'm like, I didn't even know that. You know, and so now if I ever decide to go, hey, by the way, um, what's up, honey? Like, hey, by the way, what's the best way for me to get on that show? It doesn't look weird because we've been talking for months. We're friends now. It's just casual, you know, and so many times I've seen people be rude. I'm like, dude, did you know who that was? And they're like, no, it's like that is the fucking assistant to one of the most powerful agents in the, you know, in Hollywood and assistants are very close to their agents. Like, you know, and they'll tell them, like, don't hire that guy. He's an asshole. You know, because this is the thing. You have to be nice to everyone because people want to work with people they like, and that's a bottom line in any field of work or business. People want to work with who they like, all right? And I'm not talking about being fake, okay? Anyone right now saying, like, well, I don't have to be nice to everyone. You know what? If you don't want to be, if you're actually sitting there like, what, Ellie? You expect me to be nice to everyone? Then that means you're a piece of shit. And then you know what? You don't really deserve to, you know, spread happiness if you're going to have so, so, that that kind of bile coming out of your mouth, that kind of acidic bile. It's like, don't you want to spread happiness? And again, I'm not saying you got to kiss people's asses. Just be nice. How fucking simple is that, you cocksucker? All right. Anyway, um so that is the best advice I can give to anyone starting out in this business. Um there's a whole nother episode I'll do on, on what I think is hacky. But for now, I just wanted to co- focus on that. This is like, that was a quick about, let's see. It's about a 40-minute episode today, specifically on how to approach stand-up comedy. Um, I think, I don't think I've left anything out. Uh, like I said, just get on stage as soon as possible. You know, you know, watch as much comedy live as you can. You know, I guess that's my last piece of advice. Watch as much live comedy as you can in the comedy clubs. Okay, don't just go by what you see on TV because sometimes there's a lot of hacky comics on TV. Even some of the most famous comics are very hacky, you know, but they're very popular. So they get on TV a lot. You need to watch a lot of stand up comedy live because you'll see what topics are played out and done to death. What topics are original? When someone comes in that really stands out. You know, especially if it's a headliner out of town. Like, you can't just watch the local comics. Don't go just by locals because they're just rating each other against each other. Go to the biggest comedy club in your town. Go on the weekends when headliners from out of town, especially headliners you've seen on TV, watch them perform and see how they do. After months and months of watching comedy live, you really get the hints of, like, what is hacky, what is original, you know, and what does my voice lean towards. Anyway, bitches, if you're out there looking to get into comedy, I hope this helped. If you're not looking to get in comedy, I hope this was entertaining. If not, go fuck yourself. I don't give a shit. I'm still funny. All right, bitches, I love you. I'm out. Uh, but anyway, this week, let's just get into it. Uh, I got Pete here on the podcast. I've been saving this particular subject because um, a couple of weeks ago, if you guys tuned in, I did a podcast specifically just about how to get into comedy, a.k.a. comedy for dummies. And what you guys don't know is that I had to cut that in half because I was running out of time. And I wanted to do another section. So I guess this will be Comedy for Dummies Part 2. And I definitely wanted to pee on this because um, I – right he's now, a dummy. Because he's a dummy. <laughs> uh, because right now what I want to talk about is fucking hacks. All right. Now – Right in the butt. Right in the butt. Okay. Now, anyone who doesn't know what a hack is, in the comedy world, when someone's like, that guy's a hack – it's not just someone who's awful as a comic, not someone who's just like, you know, a, a shitty comic, but someone who's doing very cheesy, uh, predictable, quote unquote, hacky material that is just like overdone, played out, predictable, 
And it's just it's ridiculous when people do it. They're mm-hmm. awful in a cliche way. That's actually thank you. Cliche. That's that's the word that was missing in a cliche way. And so the reason I was inspired to talk about this with Pete is I'm in New York right now, and the other night I happened to go see uh, Pablo Francisco headline at the Gotham Comedy Club, which uh, surprisingly, like I've always thought Pablo Francisco is fine, uh, but I've never like loved him because if you guys know who he is, he's a guy that does a lot of like noises and. He doesn't really do material. He just does noises and impressions. <laughs> and normally that would be hacky, but dude, Pete, you'll be very, very surprised. Like, no. I've seen this guy on TV many times, and I was like, eh, you can take it or leave it. I saw him live. Dude, he was great. It was really, really weird. Really? And I, I am surprised, because you and I have had many discussions about comics that do things like that or that do impressions, and we agree up to a point, and then where we diverge is that... Uh, I don't know if I should say you don't consider it an art form because you mm. do, but like they don't belong on stage at all. Whereas I'm like, if they can, if they can wrap, a, if they can have premises around it. But it, if it's just like this is what it would be like, yeah, like, yeah, this guy was an astronaut, yeah. No, <laughs> so. and, and dude, that's exactly what Pablo does. And what I realized, first of all, like I have to give it to him. I was watching him, and I couldn't believe I was getting sucked into this, dude. The guy really is a phenomenal live performer, and I think that's it's what like it when is. I saw Mencia. Yeah, his performance was like a ten out of like a twelve out of ten. Yeah, and <laughs> I didn't want to like it. Yeah, exactly. That, that's the thing. Like I was watching Pablo, expecting like, yeah, what's going to happen with this, you know? And you couldn't believe the hour just flew by. And also, I think for him, because it's a mixture of impressions and funny noises, and there's a lot of interaction. Like, and you can't sometimes that kind of act, I don't think translates to TV. I think that's what mm-hmm. it is. When you watch it on TV, you're like, this guy's stupid, you know. But when you watch it live, it's kind of like you're at a party and there's a funny guy at the party, but now just add a stage to it. That's exactly what it felt like. He would interact. He would stop. He would interact. He would talk to someone. He would address someone, then jump right back to his act. He basically, dude, he did like no jokes, like no premises, no material. He just did like, you know, and then Arnold Schwarzenegger in the tech club, and he would just jump around. But his impressions are pretty tight. Um, he His music impressions, like he'd be like, and this is techno music, and this is that. And I'm like... Wow, I'm really enjoying this. Now, again, what I call it stand-up comedy, I don't know, you know. But it is a form of comedy entertainment, and there is no other form or venue to perform it in. I'm like, it's got to be in a comedy club. But anyway, so if Pablo happens to be listening to this, which I'm sure he's not, uh, I was very impressed, and I would see him again live. I actually would. And this is the thing, though. Um, I was talking to another comic there, and they mentioned something that was very interesting. They're like, yeah, I mean, Pablo is one of those guys who has a huge following without a TV show, without major movie credits. You know, he's done a few TV you know, sets here and there in his half-hour special, but that's it. And I'm like, that's true. Like, this guy tours around the country. He's a big sellout. He's a big draw. And, like, he sells out all the time. And, and he doesn't have any major credits. And I was very, very impressed by that, you know? I'm Googling him right now. Okay. This is the thing, though. Like, he had uh, two opening acts that clearly tore with him, okay? And, dude, these guys <laughs> were fucking awful. The hackiest hacks ever. Like... I, I mean, dude, almost... Break every, it down, like, by race, by age. Yeah, exactly, everything. dude. Every possible premise, they went... Every hacky premise, it's like, they went from black and white people are different, to the Asian voice, to <laughs> gay people, to, you know, every possible hacky thing. And I'm like, this is a fucking study in hackiness. Like, this Did is, it kill you that the audience ate it up? And the audience loved it. <laughs> the audience loved it. I just it. guessed that, by the way. Yeah, we no, didn't talk about this. Yeah, we, they ate it up because... <laughs> We've talked about before where an audience doesn't realize someone's a hack. If everyone in the show, if everyone in the lineup is hacky, they won't notice. But I'm telling you, if you dropped Bill Burr into that lineup, as soon as he was done, it'd be a very subconscious thing where I think the entire audience would start realizing, like, wait a minute, the we other just laughed at horrible comics. Yeah, the other two comics are horrible compared to <laughs> this guy. We just yeah. didn't know any better, you know. And um, and by the way, I mean, obviously, it's going to sound like I'm just nitpicking or I'm taking it personally, but every fucking hacky comic I've ever seen always does the Asian accent. Always, always, 1,000% of the time, you know. And um, <laughs> and by the way, whether they're talking about Asians or any other race, you know what they always go? They always say, hey, you know, because like, I'm, I'm not racist. I love black people. But it's really funny. My black neighbor is like this and then proceeds to do like the most racist impression <laughs> possible. 
They always do that. I never, ever, ever apologize for any racial humor I do. I don't think I've ever been like, hey, I'm not racist. I'm just saying. I never do. I just do it. I just do my set because I'm like, listen, you should be able to tell by now that I'm not racist. And if you don't, then no, no matter what I say, it doesn't matter. You know? And also that I'm kidding if it's like a far-fetched, ridiculous thing that I'm doing. Exactly. It's a joke. Exactly. But so really quick, I'm going to go down the list of things that I consider very hacky. And please, Pete, jump in and add to anything that I say. But right away, so... I, I wish I knew this was coming. I would have prepared my own list. No, no. I want this to be raw. <laughs> raw. Going raw. Raw right. dog. Uh, but honestly, I personally hate anyone who does Asian accents, Indian accents, the white guy accent. Oh, because, you know, my boss, he was like, oh, because, you know, I used to work in an office and the guy would talk like this all the time. Like, I fucking hate that. I hate this. The black accent... Every time, like, a non-black comic does a black accent, he always does, like, the accent from, like, the 80s where it's like, yeah, and then my friend Tyrone went, yeah, man, I don't like that shit. And I'm like, I don't know a black guy who talks like that. It's like the Warriors or something. Yeah. <laughs> sure enough, you know. Uh, all right. Yeah, except any cop in the city is looking to bust our head. Yeah, it's just crazy. <laughs> And then the gay accent, which someone could accuse me of doing because I do have a particular joke. But my joke is about talking about the different gay accents. But <laughs> what I'm talking about is when they do the gay accents specifically. It's it, you can tell it's not to describe a story. It's just to. It, and a lot of hacks will defend this. Like they do these accents just to get the just laugh, to elicit a laugh, yeah. elicit a laugh from the accent itself, yeah. not from the story. Because don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's impossible to do any of these accents and not be hacky. I've seen many comics do it, but they do it in a way because I can tell like it's not about the accent; it's the story. You know, um, but uh, all right. So anyway, um, before I move on off of accents, I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, this I won't say necessarily. This is a hack thing, right. but it's something that's common and may eventually be hack. I've seen good comics do it for whatever reason. They do what's almost like a gay accent whenever they're quoting their girlfriend or wife. Right. Like I don't know why it has to be lispy, right. high pitched. I understand, so you know, okay, I'm doing a character that's yeah. different from. Me, just the audience knows. This is me talking. This is a woman right. talking. But why it's always lispy? Yeah. And like why? I'm like why well, don't want to know why they do that. There's nobody yeah. that speaks that way, female, right. that we know of. The other thing is, uh, it's like when a comic will say something just happened, and I God, often I hate that. I often say literally what just happened to me because yeah. if I'm at least hosting, because I'm like I have some of the same people coming back, yeah. so I'll describe something that just happened on the way in or whatever. But they know it, like they know it, because uh, I'm still working it out. But there's, I don't know why. For I've told plenty of old stories. It's not any less funny if it yeah. happened a month ago. I know. It's like they have this fear that if if the audience knows that they've told the story repeatedly yeah. before. I mean, I told people about how I, you know, how I did something when I was 16, like yeah. last week, and it was still funny. Yeah. And I I told them what year it was. I hate that when they were like, "I was in a store today." No, you weren't. This yeah. happened on the oh, I was uh, crossing know, the street today. It's like no, you were. It's like yes. Yeah, so like oh, I'm, I'm glad I I, I hate this. <laughs> I glad I got here on time. I was on the train, and you know what happened? No. I'm like no, it didn't. No, no, it didn't. No, it didn't. <laughs> I hate that. It's like I just broke up with my girlfriend. I'm like I think half of that might be true. I'm like you didn't just yeah, like, it was like a year and a half ago. Yeah, when you wrote like, that bit, and I'm like, dude, I, I absolutely agree with you. I'm like, what's why don't you just go? So one time I was in a store. What, what's the fucking difference? You know, I hate that. Like I hate when comics lie, which is funny because like you know. Obviously, things that I do an exaggeration, but it's an exaggeration of a form of truth. I, I don't think I've ever told a story that didn't actually happen somehow to me. Right. But when people tell stories, I'm like, that never happened to you, dude. You know? Um, I fucking... I just fucking hate that. I don't think there's any need for it. There isn't. Necessary. There isn't. No one, no one needs to believe that. All right. Um, here are things that I hate <laughs> that MCs do or, or comics do all the time, which I see is... You know, this is more an efficiency thing, so I'm probably being anal with this. And then, uh, and you host a lot, so you might even have to be guilty. We've talked too. about these, yeah. but just like, giving it up for no reason. Yeah, Sorry. exactly. No, 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 that's exactly <laughs> it. I mean. That's exactly it. It's like, when people are like, all right, uh, how you feeling tonight? And you already know they're going to ask him a second time. It's like, how you feeling tonight? Eh. No, come on, guys. No, I, I, you can do better than that. How you feeling? I'm like, dude, just fucking start the show. Just fucking start the show. I hate that. It's like, if you, and the, and the comics are always like, I'm trying to raise the energy. You want to raise the energy? Then be fucking funny when you start. You be funny, that will raise the energy. You asking people to give you more energy, I hate that shit so much. And then, let's say the show started in the middle of the show, I hate how between every single comic, they're like, 
You guys ready for some more comedy? What? It's, it's fucking point. What happens if the audience is like, no. <laughs> it's like, oh, I guess we'll have to stop the show, turn off the lights and go home. there's that rule of like, try not to ask questions of the audience until they'll take over. Yeah. The, they're not likely to say no, but still, I mean, you are asking something. A lot of these things do trickle into my thought process when I'm hosting because I'm like, eh, I stop myself. So now I won't. I never really did ask that, but what I will say is I'll make it an assumption. I'll be like, all right, I know you guys are enjoying or like, exactly. I you guys enjoyed that. Like if they did, yeah. like the, I just had a musical guest. Like I know you guys like that. Let's keep it going. Um, but the New York phrase is like, are you ready for more show? Yeah. Who's the first person I heard doing that? Leo Allen would do it mm. uh, consistently at, at uh, UCB. Who's ready for more show? But then I'm worried, ever since our conversations, I'm like, what if I keep doing that? Like, yeah. I, I don't want to keep doing that throughout the whole show. Yeah. I'll say, like, all right, that was a great star. I'll be like, so what did you, someone's like, so what did you think for, like, a free yeah. show? And they're like, of course, they're like, yeah. And then I'm like, all right, I know you enjoy that. I'm going to keep it going. So I try to, because of that, I'm, like, yeah. super self-conscious of asking any type of questions. I'd rather just assume the positive uh, choice of those. No, you know exactly. What I'm you should. Like, assume they're having fun. Yeah. Like, hey, I know you like that. You know, but I, but I, I'm sure I still say like, "Are you ready for the next comic or the last comic right. or something?" So yeah. I shouldn't even do that. Just as a comics for dummies, what do you think about that? No, so, I, I think you should never ask ask questions. I think you should dictate. And then, by the way, it sounds like so fucking dictatorship the way I'm saying it. But you should ask questions. You should, like the way you said it was perfect. It's like, hey, so I know you guys enjoyed that, and you probably have a few people like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, go. So let's just go right into our next act right. because. Anytime you go, are you guys ready for the next comic? Yay! Okay, so the next comic coming to the stage is blah, blah, blah. That little applause break, that per- every time, think about this. If you have five comics in a show, that is five times the, en- the audience is asked to throw out that energy that's completely wasted. That's five applause breaks for absolutely no reason. So you know what that really does? It fucks over the very last guy. Because they've been asked, because like, alright, so there's five comics, but before every single comic, they're going to applause when you see the person's name. On top of that, they're going to applause when you say, are you ready for the next comic? So that's 10 times they're applauding. So 10 mm-hmm. times of applauding, they're like, by the time they get to the end, they're like, we're kind of tired. We've been yeah. giving it up all night. Just like, just go, hey, so, you know, put your hands together for blah, blah, blah. And then just have that applause come in as you see the guy's name. Because I'm, I'm telling you, I see it all the time. Right. Where it's like, um... Give it up one for a t- give it up one more time for the last guy. Yay! You guys having a good time tonight? Yay! Are you guys for the next guy? Yay! Yay. All right, so yeah. the next guy coming. It's like, <laughs> dude, fucking just bring him up. I hate that, you know. And then also, what I hate is every now and then a comic will do this. Like he's he's um, he's been guilty. A comic's guilty of this. They're wrapping up their set and they go, um, all right. So hey, c- should I do one more joke? It's like just fucking do it. <laughs> don't ask because then again, yay! Do one more joke, dude. Don't fucking ask for applause. Just do it. I never go, you know. And some comics I see specifically because they're trying to get like sympathy. Like I don't know, they, they want me to leave. No, stay. <laughs> Just fucking get into it. It's the hackiest shit when you're begging for approval. But are you gonna say something? Yeah, the second to last thing dovetails into like a hosting for dummies. When you're talking about the asking for applause and draining them, mm-hmm. because we've had this. There's uh, on a professional or club show. Like I've asked you, how many do you think it should be? And we. The general consensus, along with your opinion, has been like, have four comics on, plus the host. Five personalities. Yeah. More personalities than that is draining on the audience for several reasons. One is like, they're going to have to remember now like a lot of different people. Yeah. And two is, of course, being asked to keep keep on applauding. And it, it is, as much as it can be, like a verifiable fact. If you have a show that's, say, an hour and 15 or 90 minutes, whatever it is, if you have a show that's an hour and 15... With five personalities versus one with eight, yeah, like they're just more tired. Even though the same amount of the same time, amount of time, it seems like a longer show. Yeah. And they are asked to give it up for the next one. Are you yeah. ready for the next one? Yeah. We only have two more. Yeah. I've even made that mistake and seen it and not done it because of that. Where people were like, "All right, we've got just another three comic." It's it's like you're apologizing. Like, yeah. Hey, we're almost through this yeah, ordeal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Stick with us for three more comics. Yeah. And no. like the smart comics pick up on that. They're like, yeah, because we're we've only got fifty more comics yeah. left, ladies and gentlemen. No, because I mean we've discussed that in the past. Where I equate, I've always equated to like, look, if you go to a party and you meet eight different personalities, it's more exhausting than meeting five. It's just the way it is because like you have to, your mind has to readjust to absorbing new energy, and that I mean it does t- it t- you know take something out of you compared to. You know, like if you went to a party and you just talked to one person the whole night, even if you talked to that one person for two hours, you won't be as tired as if you talked to ten people over two hours. It's just the way it is, you know. Um, but especially it shows. Absolutely it shows, you know. 
Um, that's why, I mean, there, we talked about this. There are shows that go on for three hours, and I'm like, I don't know what the fuck that's about. That makes no sense to me yeah, whatsoever. I don't know why. And they expect the audience to come in and leave, and yeah. other people to come in the middle of it. it. It doesn't make any sense. It should be just like, just end it at two hours. I mean, I think a perfect, we talked about this, I think a perfect amount of time for a show is about an hour and 30 to 45 minutes. It's exactly the amount of time. Like, it's either an hour and a half or an hour and 45. I think an hour and 45 should be the max. Yeah, yeah. I never push mine past 140. Maybe one anywhere from an hour and 20 to an hour and 40. All right. Like if, I think that's a most. perfect amount of time. Not longer than a movie. Yeah, exa- that's exactly it. That's the attention span of a human being. And uh, just a quick couple other things that I think are very hacky. These are physical things, but <laughs> I'm sorry, but any time a comic fucks the stool, <laughs> uses a mic as a dick... <laughs> or and this, this is a very this is a very BET thing. I've noticed this is more with black comics than any other comics. If they either when they do their punchline, they make a noise or they swing a towel or they use some kind of prop <laughs> to always. A they swing a to, there's a com, there's a black comic, <laughs> a very well known black comic, who swings a white towel at every punchline. Hamburger, yeah, <laughs> hamburger. And you know, I mean, one, it's he's ingenious. Still. It's really ingenious because he's conditioning. He's them. conditioning them. Yeah, because like. All they have to do is do three or four jokes that kill and swing the towel. Every time the guy swings the towel after that, people laugh regardless. And I've seen it. And there was one time, I think I told you the story. I was in Arizona. I did the show. And one of the opening comics, at the end of every punchline, he would go, yep. Yeah, he did tell me that. He, at every punchline, yep. So as soon as I went on stage, I did a joke. It killed. I waited a few seconds. And then I went, yep. And the entire audience cracked up because they knew exactly what I was doing. And again, I'm not dissing these guys. Like, it's your form. I mean, if you ask me to my face, like, do you think that's hacky? I'd be like, yeah. Because comedy is supposed to be about originality. And already you're, you're, you're already crushing your being original because there's something predictable in your act. That the fact that every few minutes you're going to do something in your act. Right. Just like, you know, hamburger. Get her done. You know, <laughs> you might be a redneck if... You know, and I hey, I love Jeff, Jeff Foxworthy, but like you know, he, I, I sometimes I feel like, do you think down deep inside he's like, fuck, I love doing comedy, but every concert I have to do, you might be a redneck joke. I can't get Does away he from still this shit. Do it? I, I have no idea. I have no <laughs> idea. But there must have been a time where he was like, God, I can't, I can't let go of this thing. But now. from all those guys, though, he's like, he's a self aware, like a good comic in yeah. the sense of like, I I like it. We've yeah. talked about this many times. Like I. People might consider him to be as hacky as the other country guys, the good old, you know, blue collar guys, but I don't, I like, I like Jeff Fox really. Yeah. You know, I've always liked him, you know. But, uh, but yeah, anytime you swing a towel, um, <laughs> like, uh, you know, take off your hat and slam it on something, or uh, take it, there are guys who always take a sip of their drink out of a beer bottle at the end of every joke. I noticed yeah. it's like their thing, it's like joke, 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 punchline. Well, beer that's bottle. like the security blanket, bringing yeah. a drink to the stage. Yeah. It's one thing if, like, you bring water because you know you're going to be talking a lot, doing a long set, yeah. and you, you stop strategically when you need the drink. But right. I see a lot of comics, like you said, they're used to doing it, and you, if you look closely, they never take the drink. They'll put up to, and they'll say something else. Yeah. Not never, but there, there's times where they're just going through the motion. They never actually take the sip. Yeah. But they're so used to doing it that you know, picking it up at, let's say, at every punchline, yeah. and doing that. That's a hacky thing, bringing the drink up. But especially it if it's looks, like a five minute set, it it's looks like, insecure. It's like, look how cool I am, especially if it's like an alcoholic yeah, drink, yeah. or or mentioning that they're drunk. It's it's it's. Two things. It's like one. It's like an. Ex- it's, it's an excuse. For like for what you're about to see. Like I'm really drunk right now. So if I say anything, hey, if it flies, great. I'm drunk. And if you don't like it, well, I'm drunk. So this isn't my best. Exactly. They don't say that or realize it. But yeah. I think that's part of it. And do, I mean, if we're talking about safety blankets, a, lo- a lot of people use the mic stand as a safety blanket. Safety blanket. And dude, I'm guilty of it too. Every now and then, sometimes I anchor myself where. If I'm a little bit lost, for some reason, I notice I'll go back to the mic stand and grab it just to hold on to it or lean on it, and somehow that centers me. And yeah. like, I try as much as possible not to do that. Especially, obviously, if I'm a, if I'm having a great show, I never do that, you know. But sometimes I might be thrown off by something, and I just need to like center myself by going back to the mic stand. But there are guys who like they literally lean on the mic the entire time, and even though it's like a small little pole, the size like the width of a thumb. They don't realize, like, psychologically, you're hiding behind the mic stand. It's like a shield to you, you know? Um, there are guys who are always fidgeting with the mic stand. Like, the top of the, the head of the mic, they're always, the head of the mic stand, they're always fidgeting with it. I'm like, let go, dude. Let go. Because yeah. you're concentrating on that instead of concentrating on your material. 
I do it with like tight because all the comics like loosen my fucking mic stand. Mm. So I'm, you know how there's like several things to yeah. tighten it. Yeah. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, that's what it looks like when I'm doing it. But I do it, and then I also I try to raise it or lower it to the height of the next performer yeah. if I know. But I now I'm like I used to do it a lot, and I try not to touch it. But I still work with the mic on the stand. But I do that because I you know I gesture wild yeah, yeah, with yeah. both hands. Yeah. So I'm like that's what I'm gonna do. Okay. But uh, lately I've been doing it more where I'm like almost rocking with it a little bit or right. whatever. I mean I, I I used to go back and forth. There there were times I used to literally lean like the, the mic stands in front of me i used to make it lean forward <laughs> and i'd i'd put one foot on the bottom stand so i could always anchor myself so i wouldn't end up falling forward but i would actually lean forward on the mic stand like ho- almost hovering over over the first person in the audience and i used to do that and i realized like uh it's a cool thing to it looks it looks cool it's like rock starry yeah yeah <laughs> and i'll do it every now and then in an hour but i realized for a while like i was doing it way too much with the time that I had on stage. It's like, you, all these things we're talking about, you can do every now and then with a mic stand, but just like throughout the entire set, you know, like if you're drinking your beer the entire set, it's like, dude, like you, you could legitimately be thirsty, but I've seen what you're talking about all the time. I'm like, that guy's not really thirsty. That's his prop. Yeah. You know, he, oh, there's a couple of phrases that are just cliche things. Like, I forgot what they are, but when somebody takes a sip, they'll be like, ah, there's one comic I'm thinking of. Mm-hmm. Like, or they say, oh, man. Like, in between things, like, what am I going to do next? In, in Life time, is crazy, man. Yeah, Life man. is crazy. Life's rough. <laughs> Don't know where to begin. <laughs> <Yeah, man. laughs> you stand there like a sack of wet <laughs> flapjacks. <laughs> we're doing Dr. Pepper. That's um, one of my favorite bits. Yeah, we're, we're doing a uh, Pat, Pat Oswalt <laughs> built about one of the craziest <laughs> open markets you ever saw. I don't know where to begin. Yeah, that's um, up, man. All right, so uh, just the last few things, and I know I saved the best for last. Um, and now you, you'll love this. Uh, I hate. I'm sorry. This is one of the fucking hackiest things you can do. I hate any comedian that has a music cue in their act. <laughs> if they have to tell the DJ, play that song. Like, you ever been in a club and like, I think you've seen this. Hey, play that song, and it's all set up. I fucking hate that. Or anyone who incorporates. A really grand dancing move or routine or singing a song in their stand-up act, I fucking hate you. <laughs> and let me explain why. Before Pete jumps in on this, because I know you have things to say, this is why. I've really pieced it together. I was like, recently I was like, why, the, why has this always bothered me? Can you describe it again, though? If they like, have a what? Okay, either someone plays a very popular song because they're going to dance to it or they're going to mime something or they just bust out into dance moves for no particular reason in their <laughs> act. Or they actually sing a song. They actually sing, and, and, and they sing it well. Clearly, the person's a singer. And these three things have always bothered me. I never knew why. And then recently, I see, I saw it happen again. I sat down and I really thought, like, why does this bother me so much as a comic? And I realized, you know what they're doing when someone does that. You know what you're doing? You are writing the momentum right. of the audience's love of someone, someone else's, else's creativity. Yeah. That's what it is. And someone's like, no, 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 but I replaced the lyrics to that song, and, you know, so that's why it's funny. It's my comedy. In the, like, no, no, everyone knows what that song is. If they didn't know what that song was, it doesn't fucking matter what your lyrics, your funny lyrics would be. They, they didn't know the laugh. song. Yeah, they, they, they wouldn't laugh. laugh. They're laughing. It's because, like, look, I changed sexy back to whatever the fuck, or, you know, <laughs> or, like, hey, I'm singing this, and I'm singing it really well, but I'm, I'm changing lyrics. Or, like, look, I'm popping, locking. It's like, what does your fucking dance move have to do with comedy? Like, when they do that, and when they finish, the crowd is always like, woo! And it's like, you are trying to get a big applause on something that has nothing to do with fucking comedy. That's like if I went to American Idol, and in the middle of a song, I just stopped and started telling jokes. And like I'll get applause at the end, like, wow, that guy was really funny. But then they'd be like, yeah, but this is a singing competition. You know, but I, hold on, let me, I'm fucking getting robbed up now. What, what, what would you like to say about it? But you, you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I hate well, that there's shit. There's a couple comics locally that do it. Uh, and before I forget, sorry, I will jump right back okay. to this. There's a guy, David Wade, so credit to him, like, he was doing, he's a, David Wade is a black comic, he's a funny guy, and he was doing, I was on a show with him, and he was, he was doing like a, kind of like a stand-up of BET comics, and part of it was like, fucking the stool, mm-hmm. and then telling really animated stories for, with like, no ending and no right. punchline, right. and of course, like, calling them out on it in a funny way. So, props to David Wade, I wish I could, uh could recite what he did but you know there are people out there that get it so there's there's hope now, about the song thing yeah no it's exactly what you said because the inverse of that would be like 
telling jokes at a singing, like a singing venue competition, and then be like, this has nothing to do with that. But yeah, it always does get. There's a, a comic I'm thinking of who I won't name because he's a really good guy. His his regular material is uh, it's not good at all. Mm-hmm. I think I was telling you the other day, right? I was like, just it's not good. Um, but he's he's a he's a steady solid performer, and he always ends by playing songs, and the songs are always like to the tune of something else. Right. So I think that's what you're talking yeah. about essentially, and and because a it's music, and because it's higher energy naturally than anything that you're gonna just be speaking. Yeah. He always ends on that, and it always does end up bringing the energy up, and for the most part, uh, people respond well because they're songs that are popular that people know. Yeah. And he's changed the. It's like a parody, like yeah. a Weird Al yeah. thing. But you know. and and I, I've said this before. I feel bad because like that is entertainment. It is a form of entertainment. Yeah, like you'd say, Weird Al was great at what he does, yeah. but you wouldn't. You'd be like, he doesn't belong in a stand-up comedy. Exactly, show. exactly. And that that's what I hate about people like this. And it's like you're just riding someone else's creativity. That's what I, you're riding the coattails of someone else's creativity, and it has no originality whatsoever. Now the thing is, I don't mind. Now I also have to say, like we we're talking about hacks, like. Anytime I've seen these three things, it's because, like you just said, like the re- their actual standard material is not good. And whether they know it or not, maybe that's why they do this stuff. But the thing is, like, okay, so for instance, I want to point out, I have a really good friend. Uh, I, don't think, I don't know if you met him, but there's a black comic named Baron Vaughn. who mm-hmm. He's on uh, that USA show, Fairly Legal. And he's a ve- he's real, honestly one of the best black, forget black comics, one of the best comics in the country. And... In the middle of his act, he does have a bit where he does uh, he beatbox. He, you know, he, and, and the thing is, he really is a great beatboxer, but he incorporates it into the joke, and it doesn't come out of nowhere. It, you know, it, it makes sense in the joke, but also, he is fucking funny without it. So that's why it's forgivable to me. I'm like, look, he's not doing this because he needs to do it to save his act. Like, it, at the end of it, like, he, he, you know, he wraps up the joke about you know, whatever. But the thing is, like, he's good at it. And he's also a very funny comic. So to me, it only it's an addition to the comedy. What I hate is when hacks do this, it's a substitute for the comedy. That's what I right. hate. But he wasn't setting it up a joke strictly just so he could beatbox. Right. Like the joke actually the joke itself, like if he didn't do the beatboxing, it would still be a pretty funny joke. You right. know? Um, and that just supplemented it. It's it definitely supplemented it. And also, um, it just like, you know, as he's beatboxing, he's he, like he stops and he says things and it's it's funny. It, it's still funny. But yeah. I, I just can't stay. I, anyway, I don't want to go into that anymore. But and and this is kind of along those lines, but just separate. And you and I have impressions. Had, impressions, yes, <laughs> yes, impressions. We've discussed this before, discussing it again. But like, um, I don't mind if there's a comic that does like an hour and he has a few impressions in it and they're good, fine. But I don't like comics where all they do is impressions. And it is an art form. It is a craft. But it's just not stand-up comedy to me, you know? Like, I, like Frank Caliendo, he's very good at what he does. His impressions are great. From Mad TV? From Mad TV. But, like, I've seen his stand-up show. Like, his, I've watched his one-hour special, and I'm like, it was boring to me. I'm like, and his impressions were great, but it was, an impression, it was impressions for an hour. And I'm like, I can't sit through this. You know, it's not stand-up comedy, you right. know? And I'm sure he's a nice guy, I'm sure, and he's clearly very talented. But I would love to see him do a stand-up show, no impressions, just jokes. Yeah, I don't know if that... I'm sure that is, A, everything we've talked about, and now, B, he's painted himself into that, where it's like, people are expecting me to do yeah. this. I can't even not do this live if I wanted to. Like, people are coming to see... Well, I don't know if they're coming to see it, but they see him, they're expecting him to do impressions, so it's like... They'll turn on him if he doesn't, too, yeah. right? So, although people like that probably they would do their impressions anyway, like they prefer to do their impressions because that's their thing and that's their crutch, yeah. right? Didn't you say you saw Daryl Hammond and it wasn't any good years yeah. ago? Yeah, I saw his stand up's not that good. It's it's actually borderline open mic. You know, it was just very it was very predictable humor, and then like half of every joke had to be wrapped up in an impression. Yeah. You know? And again, his impressions are fucking phenomenal, you know. And we, we, you and I have disagreed on Daryl Hammond because, like, I know you really think he's funny as well, but I'm like, I don't think he's funny, you know. I don't know, like, for example, who would write Clinton, but like, it was funny, but I don't think it's a really dead on Clinton. It would be more of like that whole, which was used again and again, but that whole character of like him trying to get away from, first of all, being like a sex fiend and yeah. trying to get away from his wife. Um, I thought he was funny within. As the character, while he happens to be doing the impression, but I didn't think, I didn't think the impression was great. I just thought, 
But whoever was writing that, I don't even know if he wrote that. Yeah. Like if he was on the news or something, yeah. that could have been whatever his name is yeah. that writes the news. Dude, I tell, you know, I did an SNL sketch once for with Daryl Hammond, and it just ended yeah. up they never they never they cut it, they never used it. But I worked with him. He was he was being Al Gore, and he was like chasing me down the street. And I was like, oh, great, I'll have an SNL credit for Saturday Night, you know, Saturday Night Live credit. And they, they never used it. I'm like, ah, fuck. You know, because, you know, once Al Gore is out of the limelight, I'm like, well, there's no chance I can have to bring that back for any reason, you know. So, all right, so that's all the hacky stuff that I wanted to uh, just go off about. And um, just recently, uh, I was in Arizona, and I met this guy at an open mic show. And he asked me, he's like, hey, because I, I forgot why, but he was doing something, he's a lawyer or studying law, and he has some kind of thesis, and he was like, hey, do you mind if I send you some questions about comedy? And I was like, yeah, sure. And so um, he mm-hmm. sent them to me. I thought it was going to be like four or five questions. This is like a 20-question, <laughs> yeah, I guess it's for a thesis. It's a 20-question like interview here, and again, it's really funny, like, you know, I, I talked about this in my other podcast, like, dude. You're doing exactly what you should be doing. There's nothing wrong with this. Like, you, you should be trying to get as much as you can, when you can, from whoever you can, because that's how you, that's the only way to get ahead. That's the only way to learn. But this yeah. is you know, this is a ridiculous amount of questions. Um, <laughs> but only because I have a podcast, I do have a venue to answer because I'm telling you right now. Because I like the guy I met, I liked him a lot. He was a very nice guy. He actually put me on his show, so he was very nice. You know, like if I didn't have a podcast, there is no way. I would have written you back to answer all these because this is an insane amount of questions. But let's just kind of what I thought was funny was yeah. that you told me he only told me a little bit about this, but you told me that you were like, "Well, how many questions?" And the guy like he was like, mm, "They're they're questions." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he just didn't. Answer. He didn't answer, and I'm like, I, over it. he was like, "Well, yeah, yeah, I'll send it to you." And I'm like, I, I should have seen that coming, but um, but you know, he was a really nice guy, and you know, he you know he caught me in a good moment because. Um, I was in Arizona for a night. He had a show. He put me on it. It was a packed house. The show went great. He asked me, like, right after I came <laughs> off stage, Good like, time, I just killed. I'm in a great mood. And he's like, hey, can I send you some questions? Yeah, sure. Can you send me pictures of your mother? Of course I can, you know? Um, but anyway, dude, again, no hard feelings. This is, this is exactly, dude, you should, this is what you should be doing. I wish I did this, all right? And you're welcome. And you're welcome. So I'll just try to get through these. I was always a fan of comedy growing up, but I never really saw myself you know, doing this ever. Um, oh, Pete, by the way, I'm sorry. So I'm going to answer these like I'm answering them, but any, at any given time, if you want to add to like anything I'm saying that this pertinent, please, you know, if you, if you feel it's relevant for this guy to know. Um, yeah, well, Elliot was a guy that uh, people were always telling him since he was in high school yeah. that he was funny and should do stand-up, but he actually, unlike most delusional performers out there <laughs> that think that they're way better than they are, he always just chalked it up to like, hey, that's just friends and family who don't know any better, that mean well, and are just being supportive, but no, I, I'm not. I'm not fit for that. Yeah, I, I I say this all the time. I would have never predicted. You know, one day you're gonna have a TV special and you be touring the country and you have a fan page and this and that. I'm like, get the fuck out of here! What are you smoking? What process do you go through crafting material? This is actually a really good question. I get a question. I get this question all the time because every comedian does things differently. But this is how I do it because um, Pete knows too. It's reversed. Um, I used to write everything down verbatim. I used to spend a lot of time writing out the premises, writing out the punchlines. Being, being very careful about the exact word, which words I think sounded funny or hit funny, and then I would rehearse it like a play and then perform it. I do the opposite now. I don't write anything down anymore. Um, now when I get an idea that I think is funny, I just make a mental note to talk about it on stage. Uh, but I can only do this now because at this point I feel like I'm really in touch with what, like my skill and my talent where whatever way the idea comes out of my mouth organically and naturally, that truly is the funniest way it can be yeah. because you're letting your talent write the material. You're not like, you're not using your brain. You're using like your heart and your soul of the talent, very hippie sounding, but you're using the talent to throw it out of your mouth the way it's supposed to be said. You know, your bra- you're, you got to trust your brain sometimes. You got to trust your talent. So that's how I write now. I try it, and then once I do it, I try it three different, three different times on stage. By the third time, that's the way I think is the best way to tell that joke. Then I write it down just so I don't forget it. So you've yeah. recorded, just to be in technical for people taking notes, so right. you've recorded it usually. Right. And, yeah, exactly. And just like my, uh, the other podcast, I record everything. I encourage everything, everyone to record everything. And so this way, in case I forget how I said something, I just listen to the recording. Which happens all the time, by the way. Yeah. To me, to you, to everybody. Like, they don't remember... Immediately after, like I don't remember what I said yeah. or what I did, or I'll listen to it right after. I don't remember saying that. Yeah, 
and uh, and also the reactions. They're they're not. It's not as. It's very subjective in your head. Yeah. Let the tape tell the truth. Tell of the what truth. Happened. You're like, oh, I killed, and it sucked. <laughs> or you know, how many, Pete. Actually, Pete, how many times have I told you, like, oh man, I just fucking ate my balls, and then I listened to the tape, and I was like, yeah. the day after, I'm like, actually, it wasn't that bad. Right. <laughs> you know. Um, and you know, it's really it's really funny what Pete was saying. Is like, yeah, I've listened to the tape because I like, I forget what I've said. And dude, there have been times. Almost as a third person, I listen to it. And I'm like, oh my god, that's so funny. I'm so proud of that person for writing that, you know. <laughs> and it's me, but I'm like, I can't believe I said that. That's really yeah. funny, you know. Um, three. What topics do you most like to work on, and where do you find your material? I don't really work like that. I don't try to pick topics to work on. I just talk about what's on my mind the most. And I mean, obviously, a lot of my stuff is about sex, dating race you know because that's that's what i go through in my life but there's a lot of other miscellaneous material that has nothing to do with anything um, when people say where do you find your material it's like again like i don't read the newspapers for, i mean just when an idea pops in my head so my material comes from the lord i would have to say <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. i do puns for jesus um four are, are there any uh, by the way i'm reading these questions for the first time guys so bear with me Four out of 20. That's out of 20. <laughs> uh, bear with us, guys. We only have 16 more comics coming. All right. Um, <laughs> are there any jokes or concepts that you've been able to work into your act? Was it because you viewed them as too similar to other people's material? Well, I'll definitely say I definitely avoid material that everyone else seems to be doing unless I know I can do it in an original fashion. And then the first part of that question... Um, there, there probably is there probably are topics I just barely ever talk about, but it's not because I feel like I don't have the skill to write the joke into my act, but like I just don't have the desire. Like I don't do contemporary stuff, I don't do political stuff. You know, I don't like every time there's a new election, I don't write jokes specifically about those politicians because I'm like, listen, um, half these politicians will be gone in two months, and these jokes will be irrelevant. Or even if I write the joke about the guy who won in four years. Unless I know I can definitely, unless I know I can definitely get this joke on TV soon in four years, I'll never be able to use this joke again, you know. But no, I've never had the concept where I've been like, I really want to do a joke about this, but I can't find a way, you know. I eventually find a way, or you know, whatever. Um, yeah, but you're not forcing the topic. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, okay. By the way, as we get deeper in these questions, I can see they're getting more, more like law, you know, um, law oriented. <laughs> At what point do you feel you attain rights? in your idea when you think of it write it perform it or record it is there another time you think it becomes yours right there's good this question. is a really good question because me and peter are always talking about plagiarism people stealing jokes um you i mean if you if you're talking about feeling you feel it's your intellectual property the second you think it you're like oh my god this is such a great idea i don't think anyone ha else has done this and once you write right. it but the second you perform it, even if you haven't recorded it and put it on YouTube or got it on TV, once you perform it, all comics, I believe, feel yeah. immediately like... That's mine. That's mine. I stamped it. You know? And that's something you're going to run into all the time because certain subjects, you know, at some point, someone's going to, you know, also think of the same thing. Which is why I tend to not do the stories that are in the news that are the biggest stories because I'm like, everyone's going to talk about this, you know? Um... What steps do you take to protect or safeguard your material against theft? There's <laughs> only there's only one way to protect yourself, and it's get on TV first. That's it. Once you get on TV first, that's been the golden rule. Like everyone's like, well, it's on TV, it's his. And people still will still rip off stuff, yeah. but but at least you have something there. You know, for a example, see like <laughs> look up uh, Bill Hicks, Dennis Leary, and there are people that have taken time that I don't know where they found it. From and yeah. they've done like video edits of like comparisons with years and dates and yeah. all of that. Not just them, but what like George Lopez yep. and Carlos Mencia and There's a lot been of like other ones. Cosby versus Mencia, Dane Cook versus Louis C.K., Bill Hicks versus Dennis Leary. It's all back and forth, and you know. And you know what? I think the best way to safeguard yourself against theft: continue creating great material because there's no way 100% of your act will be the same as someone else's. So. Um, there have been times, Pete knows this, there have been times if a joke of mine is way too similar to someone else's, unless I'm married to it, I just drop it. I'm like, I'm never doing that joke again. Yeah, you don't even want to take the chance yeah. of having some, <clears throat> someone accusing you of that. Yeah. The only time I, I won't do that is if I, if I am, like, there are jokes I'm like, you know, I really love this joke. I really, I'm really married to it. And one thing I absolutely, you know, another way to safeguard yourself, anytime I'm at a show, 
if I see a comic do, and this happens every few months, it happens. A comic does a joke similar to mine, and most often what it is is there's one sentence in his premise that's very similar to mine, but it's always a situation where I'll go up to him like, hey, I just want you to know, like, I have a joke that's kind of about the same thing. That, that sentence when you said blah, 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 that's very similar to one of my sentences in my bit, but I want you to know, beyond that, our jokes go in two completely different directions. So, you know, but I just want you to know that now, so this way, if you're ever on a show with me, like, if you go on first, like, you know, I'll just not do my joke right. or vice versa, but I just want you to know, I always do that, and most comics, if you say it like that, most comics are cool about it, they're like, oh, okay, cool, you know, because they know, like, if you were planning to steal, you wouldn't have said that. Right, and because you also would feel like, well... If I didn't say it back then and they see me six months later doing it, yeah. it's totally going to look like I yeah, stole that. stole it, you know. And I've said this many times and I'll say it again. If anyone could ever actually prove that I intentionally stole someone's bit word for word verbatim, I would quit comedy forever. If you could prove that to me, I would quit forever. I mean, there's, there's just no way. I would never do that, you know. Um, do you ever change your... So, number seven, do you ever change your style to become more difficult to mimic? You can't... I mean, you don't want to be mimicked. You know, even though, you know, impressions are a form of flattery. But you can't change your style if that's who you are. Because if you could easily change your style, then you're, in essence, you're not being yourself. So I don't try to change my style because I'm in fear of being mimicked. When he, when he says mimic or the way you're perceiving it, do you mean like made fun of or in, as an impression? Or I think he means, considering the last question, like being copied as in having your stuff stolen. Right. Um... Either way, you can't think like that because you always have to be yeah. who you are. And if that's who you are, no one can blame you if your things are similar. You know. Uh, sorry, yeah. one quick question. I forgot who it was, but somebody established, I think I read it somewhere, they were like, their opinion was like, don't, either just don't do open mics or it was something like, don't do your best material at open mics because it's going to get stolen. I mean, yeah. like it happens. And I am surprised at the level of borrowing that happens at open mics, but people are like oblivious. Or even uh, like defiant when they're, when they're called out yeah. on it. And then we've read stories about older comics where they're like, so what? Like, you've... I, forgot, I wish I remembered who it was. They're like, yeah, but it wasn't on TV, and like, so what? Like, they yeah. don't care. Yeah. That was the I, old I can't. I've too. said this so many times. Someone who could just do that, like, acknowledge that they're stealing and keep stealing, that person's just sold. But they don't think it's wrong. They don't think it's wrong. And like, that person really is, like, mentally broken. Like, there's something wrong. Like, they, <laughs> they, they it's almost like serial killer. Like, they don't have a conscience. It's like, yeah, what's the Like deal? a sociopath. Yeah. Um, Eight, do you think that newer comics are more at risk for material theft? That We just covered that. Yeah, newer comics not only are at risk for stealing, but for being stolen from, because a bigger comic could be like, well, who the fuck are you? You know, what are you going to do? You know? uh, number nine, in your experience, what happens to comedians in the community if they are suspected of theft? How is theft proven? It's very hard to prove theft unless you can say, like, I have a CD from 2005, and it shows I've been doing it at least since then. But they're um, ostracized, though. Yeah. They are. And, and also... It's a very small world. The, the word gets around. We've seen recent examples of people being called out on other people's shows and stuff yeah. like that. And the person just usually they they lie up to the last second. Other comics know, and everybody, even like the the newest beginner, like everybody's got some type of recording device just built into their phone. So everyone's recording everything. Yeah. So you can kind of prove when you did a joke. Yeah. I have my open mic stuff on. You know, recorded with dates on it. I can right. prove when I told a joke. Yeah, and what happens? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's exactly it. Like it's sad how serious we are about comedy. Yeah, and how it has to be that way. But people don't get it. They're like, it's a joke. What's the big deal? It's like it's something you created. You created yeah. And I always equate it to this. All right, because they don't get it. Like, what if you were? Um, you know, what's interesting? Like, if someone was an author, what if they spent two years writing a book and someone took that book and put their name on it? Everyone would be like, oh my god, that's so wrong. But for some reason, because it's jokes, no one gives a shit. They're like, it's just jokes. It's like, it's not just jokes. It takes the same amount of effort and creativity and pain, sweat, and tears to create an hour act. And if someone just comes by and takes a chunk of it, it's really taking a part. It's taking your time away. It took the time to put into that act. And it's the same thing. So think about that. If you don't understand why we get so angry about it, if like someone, if I wrote a book and someone stole that book, brought it to a publisher and put their name on it, it's the same thing. Yeah. You know? Um... And by the way, you know, it's funny, it's like, it's weird. So comedians in the community really look down on theft, material theft, and they do ostracize comics, just like Pete said, but it's amazing how the country doesn't seem to care. Like, I've noticed audiences are like, yeah, we don't care, he performs it better. It's like, that's not 
that's yeah. not an excuse. They, I, I think, though, in general, it seems that audiences think that jokes come a lot more easily and that they're told. That's sort of the impression we're also aiming to give yeah. in many ways, like the illusion of the first time or that we haven't been telling this joke for years or over and over again. We want it to seem like original and new and that it just came off the top of our heads easily. Yeah. A lot of times, though, comics are funny improvisationally and they are saying things for the first time on stage, but not like they're generally their whole act. You yeah. can tell when they're interacting and improvising versus written material. So yeah. it's... I think that the general public dismisses it because they think it's just so easy to come up with the next one and the next one. Mm-hmm. And there is a segment of comics that, not that they think it's okay to steal, but they'll just say, take the high road, turn the, not turn the other cheek, but just keep writing. Like they can't, like Elliot said earlier, they can't possibly steal your entire act. And if you have enough good material, it won't matter. Yeah. Uh, ten, how do you feel about young comics mimicking the style of more established comics does it serve a purpose or does it inhibit their initial growth as a performer, increase the chance for infringement? Um, yeah. Uh, first off, I mean, how do I feel? Like, it happens a lot. It's going to happen, which is okay in the beginning because people end up unintentionally mimicking the, the comics that they like. Yeah, they're you know? idols. I did it. I mean, when I first started, I was very Chris Rocky, you know, <laughs> very Chris Rock because that's who I <laughs> loved watching. Even though I think my biggest influences were Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy. Chris Rock just really struck a chord in me, just the way he spoke, and it was like message oriented. And then I realized that for a while, and I, I had to loosen up and be more me. And but I realized, yeah, it does. If you're just mimicking someone else and you never tap into who you really are, it absolutely does inhibit your growth as a performer. But I think that's a natural part of the process. It's like uh, that's how people learn by mimicking other people in, in some ways and their idols and their heroes. Yeah. And eventually they do it if they really stick with it, they develop their own style. Yeah. Their style changes and they become more of their own real voice instead of them delivering it in the way of or in the style of someone they like. Yeah. And speaking of which, even before you said it, I was thinking about Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor. Yeah. If you look at Eddie Murphy's stuff, a lot of it you could, I mean, he didn't hide it, in fact he pays homage to him, but he clearly was influenced by Richard Pryor. And if you watch Richard Pryor after watching Eddie Murphy, then you're like, oh, okay, now I see where some of that came from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 11. It goes up to 11. If a less established comedian had a similar style to yours, what would you do? If it's just a style, there's nothing you can do. Like, th- well, what are you does that say- mean, like mannerisms? Yeah, I mean, if, if it's clear that it's just similar, but he's not actually copying you, like, have you, have you never said, oh my god, you should meet my friend so-and-so, he's just like you? It happens! Okay. Yeah, similar personality, similar delivery, but it's different jokes. Yeah, you exactly. Do. Um, do you think the accusations of theft hurt comics in terms of the popularity? You know what? Mm-hmm. Only within the comedy community, because yeah. audiences don't seem to care. They just go like, whatever's funniest, we'll go for it. I mean, do you think anyone, no one seems to give a shit that Britney Spears doesn't write her own music, you know? No one gave a shit that, like, Madonna doesn't, or, like, no one cares. No one cares. You know, it's just like whatever, how it's marketed, if it's the hippest thing, it's the funniest thing. And with comedy, if you're funny, like no one really seems to care, you know. Hmm. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. We definitely know there are diehard comedy fans who do know the difference, you know. But I'm saying the majority of the country don't, you know. Uh, Number 13, do you think the methods employed by comedy schools or classes increase or decrease the chance for copying other comics? Um, Hmm. I don't think it increases or decreases, but... Pete knows how I feel about comedy school classes. Um, Without having to ask. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, actually, what, you, just, you just tell him what, how I feel about it because you'll, you'll say it best. Uh, well, we had this phrase we used to say ten years, like 10 years yeah. ago, and it's that you, you can't teach talent, number one. Right. Uh, comedy classes can help people, can help people theoretically, I'm saying, uh, tighten up their act. Because some of the newer ones I've seen, they do actually like a feedback with a panel of right. other comics. But a smart person is going to do that anyway. They're going to find mentors. They're going to crit- lit- record every set they do, every open mic they do. They're going to critique it. They're going to ask their comic friends just naturally. They, they, all they do, comics just talk about comedy and other comics. They'll go to a diner and they will break down what they do. And if they have anybody in their group that's more seasoned and more perceptive, that person will give them realistic, critical, no-holds-barred type of feedback, like the way Elliot would if he gave you his time. <laughs> so you, you can't teach that. I, I think comedy schools are not there in the best interest of comics. They're there to generate and to promote for their club, 
It's, it's all bullshit. It's a big feeder to feed you into doing a bringer show to annoy your friends and family to come see you. And then if they do show up to see you, you get this false sense of reality because you'll typically do better, a lot better than you would yeah. if it was an audience of strangers. I, I just talked about so that. So you're yeah. funny in front of your friends and your family and then you're encouraged to think, my stuff's funny. And then maybe the next few times you do it, you think, instead of thinking like, oh, it wasn't, it, it's me, something's wrong with me, you're thinking, Something's wrong with this audience, yeah. and some people never wake up and realize the difference. And then, meanwhile, the guy that started the comedy, it's always comedy club owners and people affiliated with them. The ones on Long Island are sleazy and slimy. Yeah. I don't even know them. Uh, I don't care for them. But they're not, they're not, I don't care what they say, they're not working in the best interest of the comic. Uh, that being said, it's not like you can't learn anything from a class. Right. Um, I don't know if it's worth... I All just don't money. know if it's worth it. If, yeah. you, if you put that same time into, I would say put that time into buying the DVDs and albums of the top comics that are out there, the yeah. top 10 comics, listening to those, seeing, you know what the best uh, advice Elliot ever gave me was get to the best shows that you can, see the best comics that you can live and in person because you'll also have a lower bar if, if you're always just going open mics and you should do that too. You'll always have a lower bar of what's good because yeah. you'll see the the best of the worst instead of seeing the best of the best yeah. um, at certain shows. And we live, so, and, you know, and you, I mean, we. Well, we're and I, I say this freely as like not a good comic myself, right. but someone that's at least aware of the difference. So you immerse yourself in the best, just like any type of teaching, and I, I would I would save your money. I mean, the, you could you could find online the same advice you get yeah. from comedy schools, but the best the thing you're going to have to do. There's a huge difference between a conceptual understanding and actually doing it. And conceptually, I understood all this stuff from seeing Elliot perform in clubs for years and years. But until I started doing it, it's completely different. So you have to do it. You yeah. have to record it. You have to get people that know what they're talking about to give you feedback, which you can do if you're not a dick. You'll make friends, other friends that are comics, and they'll give you – even beginners will give you some good advice sometimes – because they can see you more objectively than you can see yourself. Yeah. So the best, um, the best training is doing. I'm always saying that. Yeah. Just so do it. it and get other people that you that you trust to critique you and watch other people and how they do it. Good people yeah. and how they do it. And forget about like people that are teaching that are are no names because a lot of people are teaching that are no names. Yeah. You want to be taught by the best, but the best does not. The best won't have the time to teach. Yeah. Except and I, I mean, except yeah. for this podcast, I wouldn't. I would never have the time to teach a class. And I don't know if that's a hundred percent how Elliot feels. No, about it is. The I, pretty pretty much everything class. you said is exactly like what I would have said. I, just, I was taking a break from my throat, but like, yeah, it's exactly it. So I just like woke up during that. I'd never said any of that stuff before, like all together, but it just no, it's like, exactly flew out of me. That's how. That's always why it's great to have. Pete on for specific subjects because I know there's a lot of things that I won't know exactly how to articulate, but I know Pete will because he's just very articulate himself. Um, no, let's move on. Number fourteen. Have you? This is interesting. Have you ever had a professional relationship deteriorate due to arguments over the rights to material? I personally haven't, but I've seen it happen a lot. I've seen it happen where two guys. There was, I mean, I'm not going to name names, but there's two guys recently in LA who one guy's a very famous guy right now, just recently famous, and he and this guy who were good friends. They got into an argument about someone stealing material, and now they just don't talk anymore. And I'm like, that's really wild because these are these are two guys that the three of us we kind of hung out a, 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 quite a bit when I first got to LA, and it's just weird that like those two guys aren't talking anymore. That's weird, you know, because but, of one stole material from yeah, the other allegedly, and they both one is adamant it's like you stole that from me, and the other one's like, no, I didn't, you know, and you know, and I I, I know the joking question, and I couldn't I couldn't make the call. I'm like. It's close. It's close. It's like, yeah, maybe he could have, but it's it's not so similar that like maybe he didn't. You know, it's just like you know. I'm gonna ask you like if I I haven't done it on stage, but if I do jokes about the question inflection disorder that I've been talking about since the '90s, right. but you've you've done it without calling it that yeah. on TV, right. like would you consider that stealing? Because no, me, because like because because there's my idea, but your joke, yeah. but then I'd have a different joke right. because like. That particular joke, like, I happened to hit that thing about, like, the voice going up and down. But they might, but that whole set is not about the voice. The whole set yeah. is about those kind of girls. Right. So I'm like, no, that's not. Like, it would be a different joke. Yeah, and, by the, way, and by the way, like, I've definitely heard many different comics talk about that particular yeah. idea. But it's how you execute. This is how I always equate it. It's like, look, the person who invented the first chair <laughs> does not have the rights to every person who ever creates a different kind of chair, you know? So it's like, does the guy who created the lazy boy chair, 
like, did he steal from the first person who ever invented a chair? It's like, no. It's, you know, but if it's like, no, that guy invented, quote unquote, created the same exact chair. And he's like, yeah, it's my chair. It's right. like, dude, it looks, it looks just like that chair. It's like, no, no, it's my chair. I built it. And that's uh, my, my overly stupid, uh, dumbed down version of how I know copyrights work or patents yeah. work with some things. If you can show that you significantly improved or changed something. Yeah. Then that's a different. Then that's a different pattern. Yeah. Oh, and, and this is the proof. This, this, is, this is another way to protect yourself if you want to prove that you can steal. Like you know, if I had to, that whole bit I can remove because that whole bit is a good like eight minute bit about just kind of trashing women, <laughs> and I can remove that one sentence about the, a girl's inflection, and I would still like the rest of that joke is still intact. It's like right. yeah, I mean, I would lose the I'd lose a laugh off of, off of that one joke. But the rest of the material is still valid. Still, so, still stands. Yeah, still stands. Song. You know, um, fifteen. When is like no? Oh yeah. When is a joke similar enough to be considered stolen? Is it enough just be to be about the same idea or told the same style? Do the words need to be the same? Must the structure be mimicked as well? This guy's clearly is this guy a fucking planning lawyer. on stealing jokes. I know. It's like, how do I steal with that? Was I think it? I think we just covered it. Like, yeah, if the words are the same, that's stolen. If the structure is mimicked. Yeah, that's stolen because like it's about you can't prove it though with just the structure. Yeah. Um, At least not. You know, it's either. kind of like an overall gut kind of thing. Uh, I mean, clearly you can tell when it's clearly stolen, but sometimes it's like you know, it's kind of how they judge judge uh, rounds in a fight. Like the, the judge is right. like, "Listen, we just feel like this guy dominated the other guy more in this round, so we gave him the point." You know, so but overall. It, it, it's difficult and it, it, it's very easy to do if you can clearly tell it's stolen it's easy to do but sometimes it is difficult like, like we were mentioning before you know um, let's continue we're about we're almost done here uh, did we answer 14? yeah, yeah no we didn't I, just I know we number. talked but no, I didn't no we did I didn't remember if we actually asked we answered it um, do you think a blog or twitter post would be enough to demonstrate theft? what about a video performance of material should it be first to post first and write? now we talked about that before um a video performance of the material on YouTube with a date really is a great way to be like, hey, I did this first. You know, a blog or a Twitter post can be as well, but someone will say, well, that's just the the words. We need to see how it was performed. You know, um, is that how he? I don't even understand how he meant it. Does he mean your like the blog or t- Twitter post is the joke that got performed first? Is that what he's asking? Yeah, like, yeah. Can, can you prove can that? You prove, that? Yeah. I mean, basically, anything on the internet that has a date on it, yeah, whether it's stamp. blog, Twitter, or video, like, yeah, that's that's it. You know, um, just do that first to post, first and write. You know. Um, uh, one other thing, though, is uh, I've talked about this with like Ken and other people in music. Um, there's so many times, and this is the argument with, let's say, certain comics too. It's not like two similar pieces of music haven't been written before, or two jokes. Mm-hmm. Similar jokes have been told before with really no prior exposure, consciously at least, with one artist of one artist to the other's work. It just it happens. There's only so many topics people are gonna really joke about, at least the common ones, the relationships and that kind of thing. So yeah. people are gonna write similar jokes and have similar punchlines and similar concepts and twists. It's not impossible. But it's usually very obvious if you know those two have performed together, seen each other's yeah. bit or it's been, you know, on TV, it yeah. would be really stupid. Um, usually you can tell how you, when you approach the person, you can tell by their reaction because if yeah. someone didn't steal, they're like, oh shit, oh, well, I'm sorry, like, what's, what's the joke? Let's just try to clear, clear right. it up. If someone's like, no, what the fuck? And they get really <laughs> defensive, like, that guy stole, you know? Um, number 17, how do you, how much protection do you feel comics currently have? Well, I guess we kind of covered it. You really don't have protection. I mean, we do regulate ourselves in a way and like, I really believe it usually solves 60% of the issues when comics are like, listen, you know you stole that. Most comics, not out of guilt, but more out of fear, would be like, I better stop doing that, you know? But there's a lot, there's there's still a bunch of comics. It's just 40% of the comics who just won't go give a shit. They, they're so blinded by their, their desire for fame, it doesn't matter. They're like, I need to kill. I need to kill at every show, and this joke kills, so I don't care, you know? Um... Do you feel the community would benefit by further protection? It would benefit, but I, I don't know how it's going to happen. Um, 19, what are some ways that you see stand-up changing in the next few years? How would you like it to change? I, I honestly don't know. I, know. I know it will change because the with YouTube and the internet and comics now, 
selling their one hours off their website and not going straight to the networks anymore. I mean, everything's changing. I mean, that's, that's not a question just for comedy. That's a question for, you know, that's a question for, you know, everything because it's like, how is the cable networks changing because of the internet? Like with right. Hulu and Netflix streaming online, like there's so many people I talk to who are like, like don't watch TV anymore. Like, you know, like I personally don't watch TV anymore. You know, I, I'll remember right. every now and then to set my DVR and watch something I wanted to see. But I, I can't remember the last time I sat in front of the TV and just surfed the way I used to with, with, <laughs> with the cable, right. you know. Because now Netflix or Hulu or DVDs delivered to my door, I'm like, I don't have to wait for anything. Like, if I sit in front of my computer, I can watch exactly what I want to watch at the time that I want to watch it with no commercials, you know. So how will that change stand-up? I know it will change. I just don't know how, you know. I can't see into the future. Um, actually, there's 22 questions. There's so just two more. Do you foresee any problems with self? Do you see foresee any problems with the system of self regulation? We just, we already covered that. Um, it's very hard to self regulate. And you know you know what the biggest obstacle for comics self regulating themselves? Comics in general are very lazy and not business oriented. No one's gonna do it. No I was one's... thinking that earlier. They don't have a lot of them. Just don't have uh, the savvy, the finances, the the desire, the motivation, yeah. the desire to. To really even know how to protect themselves anyway. Yeah. It's just the best they can do is, is just uh, be vigilant or, you know, they'll hear from another comic that they're being stolen from and then they yeah. just have to, like, take it up with that other comic. I've always felt the best self-regulation is just individual to individual. I mean, I've, I've always said this. If someone stole from me, I would go right up to them like, listen, I know you stole from me. Stop it or something very bad's going to happen to you and I'm not joking. And I want to hear you give me an answer right now. And if they say, like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I'm like, I'll tell you something right now. Every time you're on stage, I'm going to show up and yell till you get off the stage. Now, you can either have that happen for the rest of your career, or you can stop stealing my joke. Like, it's up to you, you know? Um, let's see. No, 22, and lastly, finally, would you be in favor of more stringent protections, or would you be in favor of self-regulation, or can you define another possible way to police a system? I think we just pretty much answered that through all the questions. Like, I think an outside... Outside administration would be better because comics <laughs> wouldn't do it. But like, who the fuck's gonna give a shit enough? Yeah, if you're not a comic, it. who's gonna care enough to do this for comics and form some like nonprofit that polices comics? Yeah, and it's just do. just no one cares. Because dude, they don't give a shit about the music industry, yeah. and that's that's a that's a huge Multi- money maker. Like compared dollars. to comedy, yeah. there's way more money in music, and they fucking steal all the time and. You know, back in the day when Napster started and the arguments of, like, his beat, their beat, that song, that lyric, people are constantly suing each other for that person stole my song, and no one gives a shit. No one's going to care about comedy, you know? Um, <laughs> believe me, if, if, if I could have, if I was in heaven before I was born and I'm holding my soul and God can be like, listen, you can either be a successful comedian or a successful singer, I'd be like, singer. <laughs> singer absolutely but unfortunately i was born with the desire in my heart to do comedy so and i'm not a singer so like, what am i gonna do i gotta you gotta deal with the cards that i've been dealt with you know um hey in that last second yeah. to last scenario when uh you approach a comic and tell him to stop or you'll shut him down yeah do you think at this stage you you'd be able to have enough pull with clubs you work at? like hey this guy this guy stole this joke and you know i just want you to know i, I don't want to would you be able to pull a diva move to be like Either I'm not going to perform here or yeah. just can you not have him on? Or do you think they'd be like, I don't give a shit if he's bringing people in? Yeah. I don't think they would give a shit. It's, it's yeah. money deal with Club them. It, 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 it would maybe help if I was as big as like Carlos Mencia or Chris Rock, maybe make a difference. But even then, those guys don't perform with those clubs enough. Like, you know, Chris Rock was like, I'm not going to perform here anymore if they don't. If they do, you know, the improv could be like, you don't perform here anyway. Like you're here once a year yeah, or something, right? Yeah, to, to drop in. So. I don't think the clubs would really give a shit. So especially for me, like... But if it really, came down to, like, either don't put up this unknown person or this lesser-known person or not have me, you know, it, I don't know. I, I, don't think, I don't think it would make a difference. I really don't. I think it really comes down to self-regulation. Uh, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I definitely have friends at the improv who'd be on my side, but they'd be like, yeah, but we can't, we can't do anything. Hey, is that happening yet? I'm sure that's a big fan and that guy question. No, I, I have haven't. I've been. It? I've definitely been accused many times on YouTube of people are like you stole this from someone else, and I'm like, there's no like that's all they wrote. Like you stole this. I'm like, from who? You know, like when did I steal? Can you show me how I stole it? What are you talking about? You know, and no response. Um, and no response. You know, but I've never had uh, someone tell me like someone stole from me. I haven't had so that. You happen. haven't caught anybody. Yeah, yet. I haven't caught anyone. Thank God. Um, 
but yeah, I would, I would, I would have to handle that, uh, you know, Mike Quick, you know. Uh, but any, anything else you want to say as we wrap up the hacky, the discussion about hacky comics and stealing comics? Was there any final words? <laughs> I thought that was just a funny, somber way to end it when you're like, because nobody cares. Nobody cares about comedy. Click. <laughs> we any, shut it anyway, off. so as we do this double suicide pattern, yeah. <laughs> as Pete and I hang ourselves. So you shoot me first and okay. then they... <laughs> And uh, we're going to hang ourselves using the comic uh, comedy mic stand as the, uh, <laughs> the rafter for the rope. But uh, anyway, so this was another Comedy for Dummies uh, episode, part two, I guess. I think this pretty much answers every question related to comedy. So uh, if you're a comic I've met on the street and you ask me, hey, can I ask you questions? And I was like, listen, go to episode this number and episode that number. Uh, please understand I meant that not because I don't want to help you. It's I don't have the time right now. And this I, – I think these two episodes – thoroughly cover every possible angle in comedy you, right now would you do a third supplemental though if yeah we got, if we got more how-to questions from yeah people coming up that weren't about intellectual property absolutely that, absolutely you know but i think i mean i think this really covers everything thoroughly i think the other any other questions we get would be just random miscellaneous questions that may, may or may not deserve their own episode and i could just plop it into a podcast episode or something but having said that uh this is me ellie chang and my good friend pete saying goodbye Goodbye. And thanks for tuning in and tune in next week for another stupid podcast. I love you, bitches. I'm out. Pete uh, brought up a really good topic. And we've, again, it's one of those topics we, we've touched upon, but we haven't really dived into it thoroughly. But he had just asked me about a specific name and this comedy class or comedy school. But let's talk in detail about comedy classes and comedy schools. But do you want to mention the person? I don't give a shit if you mention the person's name. I don't, I don't know who he is. I mean, I, his name sounds familiar. I think I've talked to him on the phone once because he used to work at the Gotham or something. I think, he, uh, well, yeah, I don't think the name's really not like I'm worried for my future. Yeah. I don't think it's a bad guy. It's it's the same, it's the same thing that's going on whether it's you know the city, Long Island, L.A., Chicago. There's comedy classes going on, and I think on a broader level for for the rest of the audience to get it, uh, it's 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 basically the issue of like, can you teach creativity and art you can take but if you're a painter or somebody that's a skilled artist you hopefully or would benefit like at a young age at least in school from a good mentor someone that's going to develop that skill but what i submit and i think what a lot of comics submit is that 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 initial spark that innate creativity you can't be taught that being said there are some comics that are out there and I'm always right about just talent in general. Like I can spot it, yeah. like a seed of it. Yeah. But I can think of one or two people where I would not have guessed six months later that they were where they are. Usually with comics, it's because not because the person's incapable of learning or improving. It's because they're – or any performer. You can tell right away on stage they're so delusional and not self-aware and not understanding what's going on around them that they can't possibly – get any decent there was a guy all right i just came from a, a mic tonight yeah, at yeah. the gotham yeah and there is i was talking about this with my friend jack on the train home there was uh somebody on stage where i'm like yeah it was a, they, a couple of people were doing like it was very much a monologue mm -hmm. and they were stuck in their head and they weren't taking an account like they weren't making adjustments as they went along based on yeah. what was happening or not happening around yeah. them and they were in their own head they're not they had funny material some of them but they weren't connecting with the audience. So it really read as somebody doing characters or somebody that's an actor. Yeah. Uh, then there was a guy that went up, and this guy, he, he puts a towel down. <laughs> he does a headstand. Mm -hmm. and he goes, I'm doing a headstand up comedy. And he goes, This is my bow or whatever. And then he does like a 90 degree thing with yeah. his legs and his hips. And basically, you knew, I knew even before he went up, I could tell just looking at him, I'm like, This is like a slightly older guy. It's not because of his age. The slightly older guy that was going up, I'm like, he's going to be so fucking bad and, yeah. and gimmicky and hacky. <laughs> and he was, but even worse, he didn't, he just was not living on this plane, yeah. like at all. He and, doesn't see himself the way people yeah. really see him. And then when he stood up, when he like righted himself, he just launched into stuff that was like, first of all, was blowing out people's eardrums because he was like yelling into the microphone. He was not aware of like how piercing it was right. uh, in the ears. And then he just spitting out his material i don't remember any of it but it not only was it not funny but he wasn't looking at anybody he wasn't acknowledging anybody and he wasn't nervous this guy's done it a lot i right. can tell right he's done it a lot and eventually like people were cracking up and i'm like this kind of person is the kind of person that 
and I was like, if if Elliot was here, <laughs> I was saying this to Shirley about about something yesterday, and she's like, wow. Oh, okay, same thing. I'll get right back yeah. to it. We went to an outdoor festival. I went with a, with my girlfriend uh-huh. to an outdoor festival, like a little thing on the, mm-hmm. and there was like a group of kids. And there was no screening to this outdoor festival. Like anybody clearly could get up there and do whatever they wanted. Right, right. And they were oh my so God. they were so fucking bad. <laughs> and they're little kids. And my girlfriend is so so like the opposite of us. Right. So incredibly sweet and like give everybody a chance. And she also knows that I'm not. And right. I, I looked at her, I was like, if Elliot was here, like <laughs> Both of us, he'd be like, he'd be even more cold than us. He'd be like, no, you shouldn't even clap for these kids because <laughs> you're doing them a disservice by encouraging them. Yeah. Because you're making them think, like, because people were clapping because they're kids and they're cute. Right. These kids got off the stage thinking, like, wow, I got a reaction. I'm good. Yeah, I, yeah. I should keep going yeah, yeah. in this pursuit. First, it was, when we walked up, there was three boys. They were like nine or ten. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, my God. They were doing three white kids. They were doing, like, a... <laughs> Like a choreographed thing, but oh it was so God. half-assed. It was so fucking bad. Right. And it wasn't even cute because they weren't really little. They were yeah. like nine or ten. Yeah, yeah. And they were laughing and they thought it was fun and, you know, whatever. And then a, a bunch of girls came on. They had costumes like, they're going to be better because they're girls. They mm. took it more seriously. Yeah. And they were, but they still sucked. Yeah. <laughs> and that's when I said that to Shirley. Now, how that ties in with the guy on stage is I was, had the same thought tonight. I'm like, you know, we shouldn't. Eventually, that guy started getting laughs. Yeah. And that kind of thing, that guy that has no, like, social calibration, for mm-hmm. lack of a better term, mm-hmm. he's just no gauge of what's happening around him. He doesn't know that he sucks. He doesn't know that he sucks, and he doesn't get the difference between people laughing, laughing with him yeah, and laughing and at, at him. him. Yeah. And that's going to give him just enough <laughs> that he needs to keep going. I killed. I killed it to Gotham. You know, that went over well. Like, the best that guy's going to do is say, all right, this joke didn't work, but they like this yeah. bit. And, like, no, we didn't like any bit. We just, after a while, it's like, we were laughing, A, out of discomfort, or B, because it was so silly that we just eventually gave in and laughed. And sometimes that happens to me. Yeah. I let out, like, a giggle, and then I keep going because I wasn't supposed to giggle the first time. Yeah. And it starts, like, a little giggle wave. But I felt bad. I giggled once, and I was like, no, I don't want to encourage this guy. Yeah. And really, it sounds cold, and in some ways it is. Like, I wouldn't go up to the guy maybe and say it to his face, but if he asked me, I would tell him. I've done that with other comics. Like, I'm going to tell you what other people aren't telling you. Yeah. But, um... I never give false... You know that. I never give yeah, false compliments. I, I won't. I won't do that I'll either. just say, like, if some... Like, I will stand right in front of someone, and they'll come right off stage. And out of habit, you expect when you come <laughs> off stage, people to give you compliments, like, hey, great job. I'll just look at them like, hey, what's up? Like, I'll, like <laughs> they're like, hey. And I go, hey. But, and I'll just stop at the hey. And you know they're waiting for like, good job. But I, if they did a bad job, I won't say anything. Like, I won't go out of my way to be like, you just fucking ate your dick on stage. Yeah. But I'll just be like, hey. But I will not. And everyone around them is like, hey, great job. And I'm like, I won't say a I word. I think it's worse for the person, though, to give them any false encouragement. Yeah. And people could say, who are you to say? That person might improve. But if you saw this person... They're not. There's some people that will never get it. Yeah. There's a there's a the, the large majority of people in there, not a large majority, like a forty percent, are can go from really bad to mediocre if they stick at it. We'll never stand out, but we'll improve. There's like a good twenty percent that are fucking crazy, like delusional, like they almost think they're Abraham Lincoln, like crazy. Yeah. Where they'll never get it, but it's, it has almost nothing to do with stand up. It's like anything that they did. You can tell they're 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 not in the right frame of mind, and it's it's sad actually in a way. Yeah. And people are laughing at them, not with them, and they're going to keep going. Yeah. And then no, there's yeah. You're you're right. Like you can always recognize. Like first of all, you always recognize clear talent. I remember two people that I saw within the first year of them doing stand up in New York, and I I remember both both individuals when I saw them like this person keep is, your eye on is, this yeah, keep, keep, it was yeah. just one of those things like yeah. keep your eyes on this person and one of them was Aziz Ansari and the other one was Kevin Hart and I there remember it just like they were both like really young I met them like their first year in New York and I was just watching and I, I always said I've told the story like I think four times on the podcast but that. with Kevin Hart I walked right up to him and I was like dude you are really funny you know and that, I think that's when he was like must have been like 21 or something like that and like he was just so like likable and I just knew I mean, he wasn't. He wasn't like polished, but there, you knew there was just something, yeah, you know there's there. something there. And see, okay, see with comedy class, like you're right. So with comedy classes, we we've talked about it. We agree. Like a comedy yeah, yeah. class can teach you to like, hey, don't pay so much, or you know, you're walking around too much, or tone this down, raise your voice, this and that. 
But as far as the pure talent, like the rule of threes. Yeah, exactly. Don't step on your laughs or something. Right, there's, but no, there's... no one can teach you your voice, your message. Yeah. And I think okay, I think the major difference difference between comics that eventually make it and those delusional people you're talking about, I think the delusional people are focusing on their whole thing is about I just want to get laughs, I want it, that attention, I want to know that I can get people to laugh. Real comics are. They want less, but the real comics focus on what am I trying to say? Like, what is the message? Not message as far, far as political message or a serious message, but like, you always hear about it, but like, what is my voice? Yeah, what, that should be defined. Know? I've even asked you, and, and it's a confusing thing for comics that are on the newer side, yeah. like me, like just a couple years in. But I, I understand what it is, but I can't even verbalize it now. I think part of it has to do with, and please, I want to hear your actual yeah. definition. Is like after, like what I find is me and a bunch of comics that are new. You tell jokes, but there's some that are one type and some another type, and they almost don't sound like the same person wrote them. Yeah. Some of them are like a bit observational. Some of them are dark, and not that a comic can't have different jokes, but they they can almost contradict if they're done in the same set. They can almost contradict each other where. It's not a cohesive thing. There's not an arc to it, and that's the word I wanted to use. And there's not there's not a consistency among them, like a through line of you get an idea of this person's character. Because after you get to know a comic or you get to know their work, you're already laughing because sometimes you can tell where they're driving on the setup. And even if you know what they're going to say, it's still funny. And, of course, there's times that they're still going to surprise you, but it all makes sense. Just like if you know a friend and pretty much all of their actions you might hear Elliot said or did this. That doesn't surprise me. That sounds like yeah, Elliot. Yeah, exactly. That sounds like him. Because Elliot knows who Elliot is, and you know who Elliot is, even not as a performer, just as a friend. You're, you know your friend's character. You know what their point of view is on stuff. Yeah. So I guess point of view in that sense. Yeah, POV. And you, you know what their, uh, what their opinions are. And you're probably not going to get too surprised by what a longtime friend is saying to you because it's probably going to be pretty consistent with other things you know about them and likewise with the comic as they proceed my understanding is they tend to really put more of themselves in there versus let me just write some one-liners not that there's anything wrong with that just to try to get a laugh let me just write a joke that's like two plus two equals four Mm. this has now become more personal hopefully more deeper but also more consistent with the person I'm conveying on stage, yeah. which is hopefully who I am. Yeah. But it, if you're doing it within the shell of a character, at least, like a Stephen Colbert, yeah. it's funny because you know where he's coming from as this pundit, you know, just to pick an example. But he has, I'd say, a very consistent point of view on that show, and you yeah. know what it is, and it's well-defined. You know what his voice is. You yeah, know you know what his voice is, is his point of view. So is there, A, what's your definition on that, and B, is there a difference between point of view and voice? Are we using I think I think point of view is interchangeable. It's, it's kind of the same thing, but, like, you're right. Like, okay, Stephen Colbert has a very specific kind of voice in that character he's playing, and let's say Jon Stewart has a very specific right. kind of voice. Like, Jon Stewart is clearly, you know, making fun of, like, what you know, let's say he's talking about different political topics. He's clearly making fun of. He's clearly the court jester slinging hash at, like, the politicians. But he's also, the his voice is, he is the voice of the people. That's what he's doing. The Stephen Colbert thing is the, it's a contradictory thing, because, like, basically he is playing a character, and he's playing the voice of not the people. Right. But in essence, even though he's playing the opposite voice, he's still speaking to us, because he's like, by doing the opposite of the voice of the people, you know what the people think about this right. subject, you know? And... But I think point of view and voice are two, two you know, they're interchangeable. Like, like, for instance, like, so Stephen Wright has always been known for absurdist one-liners, non-sequiturs, and, like, do you really know who he is personally compared to a Louis C.K. voice? Because Louis C.K., like, his voice is about pure honesty, his opinions on certain things. Like, we know that he's dirty-minded, or he plays devil's advocate, or he goes, you know, he goes there. He right. goes to those, like, all right, this is, like, a fucked-up thought, but I'll make it funny. That's his thing. Now, that's a very different voice from someone that we both love, Brian Regan. Brian right. Regan's voice is very silly, and I don't even bring up the whole idea like he's a clean comic because we've, we've yeah, talked about it before. Not, like, it doesn't even say matter. one is lesser or greater than the other. Exactly. Right? Stephen Wright is one of the, I don't know if we call him a titan, or but he's a, a legend in his time yeah. of like, this is a guy that I, would, I wouldn't I would let anybody down talk. I mean, he's just as established 
his voice and his yeah. point of view is the other people we mentioned. But like, so Brian Regan, for instance, like his voice is like it's clean comedy, if you want to call it that. But also, Brian Regan's voice is very distinct because we both love it. It's silly. He's silly. Right. You know, he he's it's like. He's like Seinfeld, but then to a sillier level. Like, if you want to compare the two. Because people are like, well, compared to Chris Rock. I'm like, all right, well, that guy's like Chris Rock, but a little bit more of this or a little bit less of that. Like, in, in my earlier years of stand-up, um, I don't know if I want to say I was guilty of this, but, like, I constantly had people coming up to me saying, like, oh, um, this is before Dane Cook was huge. They're like, do you know Dane Cook? I'm like, yeah. They're like, you're like an Asian Dane Cook. And I would get that all the time. <laughs> and I understand why they say it, because we were both energetic. But I'm like, well, I mean... I can see subtle similarities, like off but the wall. yeah, off the wall, corny, silly. Uh, we're not taking ourselves seriously. We're also both very sexual with our acts. It's a lot about sexuality and like you know our stories about like dating and stuff like that. But I, I wouldn't consider myself to be exactly like Dan Cook at all. I think we we're both very, very different, you know. But yeah, so I think point of view and voice. I think that's a great way to say it's point of view, you know. Um, I forgot what your first question what question was already. <laughs> like no, basically what. If those are interchangeable, but but now what? How would you do? Def- we've described different point of views of comics, but yeah. how would you define it? Just in general, like I'm a brand new comic. People keep telling me find your when you find your voice or your point of view. Yeah. Uh, so how would you define? I it? I know. By the way, so just so you know, like when I started out, people were constantly asking, like, or saying to me, like, you need to find your voice, and I was like, what does that mean? And they all said it's going to take you four or five years to find your voice. And I was like, whatever, man. I don't want, you know, because I was already getting laughs in my yeah, first year. Yeah, it's a year. confounding thing, especially for a guy that's a couple years in. Like, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. But I learned, like, they were right. It does take you a couple years to find your voice. The best way, like, I can't even give you a definition, but I could, like, if you wrote down, you could write down a Chris Rock joke, hand it to me on a piece of paper, and I don't hear his voice, I just read it. And I could read it, and I could be like, this feels like a Chris Rock joke. So. The best way to say, like, you can't, I can't define the voice, but one way to identify it, if, like, I could tell you a joke, and you'd say, like, that sounds like something Ellie would say. Right. That's how you at least know, like, all right, at least I know what Elliot's voice is. I can't define how to find your voice. I can't define what a voice is, but I do know what his voice is. So, partially, at least, it sounds like you're talking about style. Style, or point of view. It's a mixture yeah, of a lot of, of things. Yeah, that's the same as, like, I'm listening to the radio. Vibe, maybe vibe, you know? Right. The vibe, the overall persona of yeah. the act itself. Yeah. But there's, I guess, like I said, through line earlier, there's something that is, you know, like one of these things is not like the other. Yeah. If you watch a half hour special of any of the people we, or whatever, a special, a set of any of the people that we've mentioned, there's not going to be one joke that stands out weirdly like, that doesn't sound like them. Yeah. It all kind of goes together with the rest of it, not just as a set where there's logical transitions or related material, meaning like it doesn't sound like a different person wrote it, yeah. but sometimes, especially when you're starting out in any kind of creative effort, you might do things that are all over the place until you, I guess, settle in on a style, which is part of the point of view, part of your expression, because you're still finding yourself. Yeah. Just like, I guess, an artist might start out, you know, they say a lot of people start out just copying other people that are great, yeah. and eventually No, you they, all start out that way. Yeah. And but I mean, in, in any voice. type of medium, you might start out yeah. just drawing an apple or a pear, like a bowl of fruit, yeah. and eventually you're like, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do landscapes or portraits. I want to do nature stuff, yeah. or I want to do... Yeah. Uh, and you know, okay, so with yeah. comedy, it's very important to make that decision to find your voice, because if you don't, if you don't make the, it's you almost have to sacrifice laughs a little bit, because you're like, well, I know this always kills, but I'm like, yeah, but that's killing because it's hacky, and it's a... The lowest common denominator. Like, there's certain jokes that are always going to kill, but they don't define you at all because everyone does them. So, if you don't find your voice, and I've seen many, many people who I started with that they were too addicted to killing. It's like, I just need to kill. And there are plenty, and I'm going to go down the line. Like, there, for instance, I'd be just, I don't know why I'm starting with this, but I'll just say, like, starting at the top of this, uh, there are plenty of black comics who are playing the exact same persona. Yeah. Screaming every punchline, talking about black people, white people different, doing dick jokes, talking about how big their dicks are and how small everyone else's dicks are, talking about like j- very specific things that will always kill, that will and always giving it up for all the lovely ladies. Give it in up the for house. all the lovely ladies <laughs> in the house. And the thing is, they will always kill. They will always destroy, but they will never be remembered because they're too interchangeable because their voice is not distinctive. Like you take someone like Dave Chappelle 
has a very distinctive voice. You, right. you put him on, like, you know, when he, Dave Chappelle was on Def Jam, and it was actually when he was much younger, so he actually wasn't as funny as he, he was when he really hit big, but he immediately was so different from every other comic that would come on, you know. Like, honestly, Bernie Mac, just such a distinguishable, like, distinctive voice compared to all the other people in, the, in what was called the Chitlin circuit, which is, like, the black comedy circuit. I, I mean, and again, I'm not saying, like, I have a lot of black friends, so I can say this. I'm saying this because I started in the black circuit in New York because those are the rooms that would put me on. And I spent... quote, unquote, urban rooms. Urban rooms. You know, they would call them urban Def Jam rooms. They just wouldn't call them black shows. And you know, it's funny because the black comics were like, yeah. And cool. Elliot would be like the novelty. And there's plenty of black comics that do a great send-up of that stuff yeah. on stage where they hate it. Yeah. They hate it because it's like the same way that you would hate hacky Asian comics or anybody yeah. that's like a, a, a real minority in comedy ethnicity wise and they're using their ethnicity as a crutch and you feel like you're just fucking are undoing everything that I'm trying to do yeah. and you're holding us all back yeah. or you're you're setting us back like the, like the next one is we see this all the time I'm not going to talk about are girls funny or not but there are the girl comics who they go crazy blue like that is just their move yeah, like, yep. it's all dick jokes all sucking cock jokes all filthy period jokes because like they're like it's shock value it's and to they, grab the attention the grab audience, the attention. It gets a reaction and that they're getting a reaction so that reinforces this must be working yeah. and I was talking about this too although right after I was talking about this with someone I also said this is the equivalent of guys doing this with girls it's going blue Talking about sucking dick. Yeah. I'm a slut. Or, uh, like I said, I went yeah. on stage the other night. Yeah. You were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got up and I said, nothing I'm about to say is going to get the level of applause that the phrase, I'm a slut, got earlier tonight. Because a girl was up there. She was just talking about, like, fucking and sucking, I think. Yeah. At one point she said, she just goes, I'm a slut. And everyone's like, woo! woo! Yeah. I got the, the most thunderous applause out of, like, 30 comics that night. Yeah. And, uh... This is, of course, was like an endless open mic. Yeah. So it doesn't say much. But you know, I went up there and acknowledged that. So with girls, it's, it's, uh, it's that. It's my parents want me to find somebody or I can't find. I yeah. can't find a man or my last guy was not good enough at this, that, yeah. or the other. Uh, or pretty much going blue. Or like you said, period jokes, which is another thing or an extreme thing. Yeah. And it's, you can always tell it's like this is not probably not what they really think is funny it's what they think will work will work and, 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 that's and if the they never if, like yeah if they, yeah if they never if they're just addicted to killing and then you just never find your own voice. and by the way i mean i and the, and the sorry the equivalent hack just to make it yeah. even for new guys is uh, and i'm i've done it too and it's not like we even grew out of this first one but you talk about porn you talk about not being able to get chicks or you know being with it ch- i guess those are the main w- yeah. what else for guys drinking uh, yeah, dr- drinking for both comics. There's always like the so pot much... comic. There's always like the yeah. yeah, the people that pander to. Uh... I hate. I honestly, I hate like. So who here smokes weed? It's like, dude, just Wait, tell dude, your joke. <laughs> you, you, but you saw me do that. Yeah. I, I do. That's been working lately. Where I go, I say that yeah. like, who smokes weed here? And then of course you usually get like, especially Woo, yeah. you get like a smattering of applause, and then I just be like, well, I don't. So get a job, hippies. hippies. I know that was great. And it's, it's been working fine. I'm, and great. I say like, I'm not pandering to you, potheads. Yeah. So like, I, got, I just realized we're really straying so, from the the, the the topic. So I mean, basically what we're saying we're, is we're like the voice is important. Yeah. Foundation though, the, the, yeah, of the voice. We've established what a voice is, right? And that feeds back into comedy school or any school if you want to make it broader. I keep looking at this like that's yeah. what's right. But uh, any school that's going to attempt to teach the art, it's like, well, like a, as actors, like you and I have done a lot of commercial auditions and some commercials, yeah. you learn a skill of how to audition. But they're not teaching you how to act, and there's that's debatable. Can you teach somebody how to act, or can you tell some? Can you shape somebody that has, or only shape somebody that has that raw seed of talent, mm. and maybe? help to refine it i submit that you can help to refine and encourage and help blossom somebody's already given an innate gift but you can't teach people unless they're telling what are known as street jokes like like all those jokes that are interchanged by yeah. like cat skill comics yeah that are really not particular to any one person or another yeah you can get a person maybe to a certain level if you make them a robot and say say this at this pace or whatever but then that's not going to really go yeah. anywhere and especially like we, 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 I mean, are you agreeing? Are you agreeing with that statement? No, I am. I am. You can't teach talent. You can't. You and can't therefore, teach comedy school, even if it's well intentioned and the guy's not like a sleazy guy, uh, it's really 
maybe as a turnkey effort because it's like you might take a person that was right on the edge because they're so shy. They want to do stand up, but they don't. But they buy this package deal of comedy school. They're surrounded with supportive people, sort of like your early classes at UCB or something yeah. if you want to learn improv. They get you up to the first level of like you've graduated and now you're doing a bringer show. That could maybe be the tipping point for somebody yeah. that had some that had some talent though to get them to keep going because they got positive encouragement all along the way. They got some critiques from other people. They met some good people they liked and then they got some laughs during their first performance. Right. Whereas they may have been too scared to ever do that. Or their first right. open mic experiences on their own might have terrified got, them yeah. so much that they never reapproached. And the class is like gets the ball rolling. Yeah, the know. class gets the ball rolling. But I still submit that the class is not going to do anything to further the career or the potential career of someone that has no talent to begin That's with. That's what it is. It's like if you have talent, sure. Cla- we've always said like you can always take a class to learn to be, become a better comic if you already have the talent, but you can't teach talent. Like there's, You can teach skill or improve on skill, but you can't teach talent. Right. Like the, the Talent is innate. And we talked about how um, – by the way, I, I think we haven't said the guy's name yet, so I'll just say this. Um, I, there are okay, yeah, okay. so there are people like you feel like you know isn't that kind of sleazy in the sense of you know this person is not gonna like I mean I don't think do you have to audition to be in a comedy class I think you just show up and you pay because no, what if pay. what if they okay what if they audition them they would be able to tell ninety percent of the people in this room are not gonna do well in comedy I should tell you that up front but. You know, comedy teachers are going to say, like, well, look, they want to pay for a service. I'm providing for yeah, a service. Yeah, they're not going to – they're going to justify taking the money, not yeah. giving it back and telling the person, like, look, kid, I feel bad about doing this. Right. Is anyone going to give the money back? And honestly, I've seen a lot of – every now and then when I'm bored – I don't know if there's, like, morbid curiosity, but every now and then I'm bored, I will Google, like, stand-up comedy class. And it's, I'm just curious, like, what the, what the commercials are like on YouTube. And <laughs> I watch it and, you know, they'll put, like, little snippets of their – classes and first off no offense i'm not trying to say like i'm the fucking big swinging dick of the world but i'll see this person they'll put their name up their credits and they're like i've been doing comedy for 20 years and i'm like look if i don't know who you are you're not in comedy and that's just the way like if i don't know you yeah you know i mean unless you just started i don't say like if you're saying you've been i like i started in new york i'm in la i travel both coasts you know i've been in this industry for a long time if i don't know you or even kind of recognize you on site or by name like then you're not in comedy and if you're not in comedy how are you qualified to teach a class yeah it's typically i think the only valuable information there's two things one is the connection of like well if i keep doing these bringer shows that are affiliated with this club eventually yes maybe i can get on stage but it's usually in a bringer capacity Bring your shows, by the way, meaning there's a requirement. It's not like a show you'd see on a Friday or Saturday night yeah. at a comedy club with like top names. It's a show on an off night where all the performers or most of them are required to bring a certain number of people. Yeah. So if you have friends that are comics or you're a comic yourself and you know this, I've never done this in LA. I'm early on, he's like, I refuse to bark. I'm not, I yeah. remember that. Uh, props to you. But you, uh, you're required to bring a certain number of paying people who are going to get charged. A fee, which is ridiculous considering the level of show they're going to see, yeah. which is going to suck. They're, they have to pay a fee and like two drink minimum. And you've got to bring at least six or maybe a yeah. dozen or whatever just to get like five or six minutes of stage time and have it feel like a real show. But there's ways around that. Now, I feel like anything that you can learn in a comedy club, like technical rules or skills or this is what to do or not to do, you're going to learn by trial and error. And you're going to learn quickly just by... The nature of, of comedians that you'll meet at open mics, you tend to band together with some of them. Yeah. You'll find some of them. You'll hit mics together. You'll see the same people. Eventually, you'll talk to each other. People that are really into comedy, we're total nerds. But we'll watch. We'll study it just like any other hobby. Mm-hmm. You'll watch tons of comedy. You'll read about it when you can. And you'll immerse yourself in it. Yeah. So those kind of things, you're going to learn one way or another pretty quickly. And it doesn't really matter because in the beginning, you're meant to trip over your dick. You're meant to fuck yeah. up, and open mics are the place to do that, where yeah. it's not going to permanently scar you. So you, you learn from you learn from mistakes, and no one can teach you mistakes. You right. have to make those mistakes. And if you have friends that do comedy, like Elliot was in, like you know, over ten years before me, mm. and before I even thought of doing stand up, I was always hanging out with him at clubs. So a lot of these technical details I learned by just asking him out of curiosity. How does this work? How does the light yeah. work? And those are things that yeah, you'll learn at a class, and maybe they'll accelerate that initial learning curve. 
but you're paying like a lot of money to do it yeah. when you could be out there just but I, I think some people for the sake of having like a turnkey let me start comedy approach it's kind of like that excuse. wouldn't do it otherwise yeah, I wouldn't do yeah. It otherwise. if it's gonna if if them putting down money is the only thing that's gonna keep them accountable for getting up on stage and starting then so be it but yeah. also those people if they're so on the fence that they they need that much to start then they're probably not going to necessarily keep going. They might yeah, as soon as the class is over, they might just like become slackers and not not do anything. Yeah. Now, you know, my friend that I did the mic with tonight, he's done he told me tonight, he's done repeatedly the big club on the island. He's mm-hmm. done their show more than once. I was like, "What? Sorry, their their class." Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's a paying class or the free seminar. He just okay. means to get you into it. Mm-hmm. He finds it helpful like a refresher. He's done their bringers. He's also done shows with me and many mics with me. But he'll be the first to admit, he's a very funny guy. Uh, he's not a great stand-up. He could be if he worked at it, but he's never going to. He's on that fence because he's an older guy and he has a career and he's very successful. Right. And he realizes he just doesn't have the time. And, and one of the things that this guy, a different guy now, that runs the one at, uh, at Governor's, I, I don't mm-hmm. care. I don't care about Governor. <laughs> but uh, this guy, his thing is, like you were saying earlier, who are these guys? I've been doing comedy for 20 years. The, my friend contends that this guy does still do comedy and go out on the road. I've never heard of him other than right. his name through governors. And I met him and he was fine to me. But, uh, well, what was I going to say? Well, the, the point is that that guy's experience is as a booker and as a sometime comedian. Mm-hmm. Are you learning from, like, the best? No. Are you learning from someone that knows more than you? Sure. And I think that a person that has zero experience those are the people they're going to get in their class because yeah. they don't know anybody they're like yeah. oh well this guy runs this club or yeah. they're a booker for this club so I, I mean i can't say that you can't learn anything from a guy that's been booking comedy or doing comedy for 20 years mm-hmm. but you, like elliot was alluding to before even before we press record i think yeah. like those who can't teach right yeah and then again to play devil's advocate it's like well there's a lot of basketball coaches that can't play, but they're incredible coaches. True, true. And they, they can teach technique as well. Right. So maybe they did play and they were good in there. They just know, but, but their skill really is in, in people, not so much the actual skill. They know how to bring the best and how to push buttons and how to get people to reach their peak performance. Yeah. And by the way, there have to be somewhere comedy classes that are worth their money. You know, there are like, like um, most, from what I hear, most comedy classes are about three to four hundred dollars for like a six really? week session. Yeah, I didn't even know. You know, like sometimes there are comedy seminars where it's like twenty five dollars just for like a three hour day. I'm like, well, that's okay if it's three hours and it's like twenty five bucks or even fifty bucks. It's like, like a one time seminar. Yeah, it's a one time thing. I'm like, I think that'd be worth it because maybe it's just to a shave big, off that. Yeah, like just yeah, just like you know, hone you hone you a little bit. You know, just like teach you a few things that you wouldn't know and you know, like, you know speed up the process, but. I mean, every now and then you hear about, like, a comedy class, like, a few thousand dollars. And it's promising a lot of things, like, yeah. meetings with casting and, like, a showcase. And, I'm like, that doesn't mean anything. And also, like, you can't be showcasing. If you started if you started stand-up six weeks ago and you're doing a showcase, like, you don't want anyone to see you because you're still not good. You know, that showcase doesn't yeah. mean anything. Yeah, and people early on think that they'll be good that quickly or they've been doing it a few months and now they got the hang of it. And yeah. it's like, you, yeah, you're not re- – you are – no matter who you are – you're purely just not ready at a few months, probably even a few years in. I would never do yeah. a show. Well, I would do a showcase like, fuck it, it's an audience. Yeah. But I wouldn't do it knowingly. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't back away from it if someone's like, hey, we have this spot. But I wouldn't do it as a real career move. Because yeah. also, I'd be thinking, like, you're, you're showing somebody that's going to see you and have an impression of you your worst. And that may be, <laughs> now you've already made the worst first impression yeah. you could that person ever sees you a second time, they're going to remember you as the person that sucked or, you know, whatever. Uh, no, it's true. It's true. So, you, don't, you, don't, you don't want to be seen at the wrong time. You don't want to be seen too early. And honestly, like, I've said this many times and I still believe him. I really lucked out that I really started getting good like a year before I taped my half hour special on Comedy Central. I really think that. Like, I always killed. I always got laughs. But looking back at my career, I'm like, you know, I really lucked out that finally i turned a corner and i busted through some kind of you know whatever what was whatever was holding me back and now my comedy central half hour special i was very happy with that material because literally if i gotten it like three years earlier 
I wouldn't been happy that material is somewhere for for eternity. Right. Like people could see that for eternity, and that be my last thing that they see. You know, but now I've said this so many times. Like, if I, if I go down on a plane tomorrow, I'll actually be happy that I got that half hour in the can. Like, that'll be fine. And you wouldn't have been, you wouldn't have felt like, hey, I, that was too soon. That was too me. soon, yeah. Because yeah, when yeah. I did my premium blend, which is a few years before that, it was too soon. Like, it, like I could have waited another year or two. And I mean, uh, you know, I, and you've always been kind, and you're like, oh, it was fine. But like, I, I still cringe when every now and then yeah, I look back on it. Yeah, but you cringe because you've outgrown that material and maybe that style of presenting it. Yeah. But that, to anybody watching it, is going to be like, that's funny. And it also, because it was short, that helped you. You mean you made demo tapes of that? Yeah, no, I mean, that, that to totally furthered my career. And you know what? I wouldn't have been able to got, get better if I hadn't had that boost from my first Comedy Central appearance that, get, that got me all these extra performances and stage time. And, and allowed you to get even better yeah. and to give you that psychological boost and confirmation of, like, yeah, I'm going to keep going because yeah. somebody saw something in me. I'm not, even though, like... The whole idea of being on TV as any type of as any type of confirmation that you're good, it's it's so. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of people that make it on TV and they are good, but early on, it's like uh, those two things are almost independent. Like, yeah. just be, there's a lot of things on TV and in the movie theaters that suck. Yeah, but they made it there somehow. Yeah. Uh, not to take anything away from your no, no, it's, no, it's true. Blend. It's absolutely true, dude. When I first started out and I go to comedy clubs and hang out, I'm like, how the fuck does this guy get these credits? How this did guy's he awful. Get there? Yeah, he's awful. Credits you know? mean credits are such a fucking lie. Yeah, credits only mean something if the guy's good. Then you're like, yeah, good. Yeah, but then if sense. he's bad, like if you're bad, just because you have credits doesn't make us forget that you're bad. We're like, this guy really sucks. I don't give a shit. He just won the like the Academy Award. I'm like, I don't care. This guy sucks. By the not to ruin it for uh, for other people like the, there's people yeah if you if you go to see Elliot and the person says you've seen him on uh, Comedy Central in his own half hour special and on Chelsea lately he's telling the truth that's not a bending in any way of yeah. the truth but if I go by the same like transitive properties of skewed comedy thinking I go on stage I I never I would not do this but I could say. They could say for me, you've seen him on Comedy Central. You've seen him on and name like five other networks. Yeah. Those are true. The first little TV gig I got, it had nothing to do with stand-up. Right. It was aired on Comedy Central. Yeah. But that doesn't mean I was on there in any real capacity, let alone as a stand-up. Yeah. But there's a lot of people that do that. There's a guy who's actually pretty funny that Elliot seen, decently funny Long Island guy. And I was like, what are you doing, man? He's, he's listing like NBC, Fox, because he's done extra work on a lot yeah. of shows. Or he's done some commercials or movies. And I'm yeah. like, you're really, really stretching. And you don't need to. Yeah. The, guy can name, the guy can name like five big clubs that he does consistently on the road easily. And he doesn't. He names like networks. Uh, yeah. But I guess it doesn't matter. No, you know what? When it comes down to it, funny is funny. And like I always tell people, like I'll give either one credit or two. But I don't like comics who are like, there are a lot of comics who are like, I want you to say like these three to four specific credits. I'm like, dude, no one gives a shit. Like, because if you're not funny, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So I'll give like one credit just so the audience is relaxed. Like, okay, so this guy has a credit. Um, it's like a 30 second introduction. Yeah. Like it's boxing or something. Like yeah. the thriller in Manila. Are you ready to love? <laughs> You know, and then uh, the same thing, like every now and then you'll hear someone like, he won the funniest person competition in San Fernando uh, Valley. Or like, he, he was like, I've injured a lot of people that way. Yeah. He's like, he was the number one student in his comedy class. I'm like, dude, oh, that boy. doesn't mean anything, you know. Um, There's a comic I know who goes, he, he's got real credits, good credits. And he goes, <laughs> he always goes, just say top 64 at Governor's. <laughs> and like everybody, just especially the comics, just start laughing. I'm like, he was in the top 64 at Governor's Comedy Competition. And, uh, yeah, this, this is a guy that, by the way, is like, keep your eye on this guy. Right. Young, really funny. Um, but the same, but he gets it. He gets yeah. why that whole thing is ridiculous. So he's like, Put, say my worst credits. I go up there with that. Yeah. And people are like, what? Like, that's yeah, pretty that's ballsy, I, though. That means he's got to absolutely rely on his skills. Oh, he's great. Yeah. He'll go up in any environment. He'll kill just on what's going on yeah. in the room. So I'm going to paraphrase... To paraphrase what we were both for both of us, yeah. and then Elliot will uh, kick in, is I guess we're not outright for the two people that are listening and debating taking any kind of school or class for comedy right. or any developing any other type of artistic endeavor. Uh, we're not going to say don't do it, but uh, my, I guess, caveat would be be aware of like who's running it, what you think their intentions are, trust their gut. If it's a, an absurd amount of money with what seems like 
promises that are too good to be true, like instant exposure or any type of guarantee of success in art, yeah. obviously that should be a red flag right there. But there's plenty of things that are like a QA and a for 20, 25 bucks. Like I did that for acting mm -hmm. once and it really helped huge. And it was with notable casting directors and they did like a real ass kicking like three plus hours and it was like 20 bucks and it was like they really were gave you a lot of hard facts so there's people that will do similar things for that likewise if it's a skill you need to develop like if you have that passion uh and that this is the tail end to that is i think that the, the right success for any artist combination of qualities is is the burning desire because they have you have to have that that momentum to keep going and that ambition to keep going and do what you have to do and put the work in. But that has to also meet some level of raw talent. And there's people that'll get religious and be like, if you have this burning desire that's in you, like God put it in you, mm. it means you, you have this desire to express the talent. But I think there's plenty of people that have some burning desire and they keep going and they have the ambition and the drive, but they don't have any of that talent. You can only do so much. And then sadly, there is a lot of people that are talented that you never hear from them. There's plenty of better musicians than everybody that's on the radio yeah. out there. But do they keep, do they meet the right people? Do they keep going? They don't have the drive. They yeah. don't have the drive or they just, they, they're not in it for that, which is fine. But you, you need a mix of both. And you really don't have to be the best. You don't have to be the best out of the gate. You have to be, you have to have like a, a realistic sense of like, do I have, do I really have any iota of talent, any yeah. grain of talent? And you know, like, with, with drawing or something, it seems like people know right away. Kids just start drawing before they get, like, formal training or painting or singing. There's yeah. people that just sing, and they, they may not have had vocal training, but you know that there's something there. Yeah. And I, I'm not even talking about by the time they get to American Idol. I mean, you know people. And then you also know people that sing no matter what, and they're horrible, yeah. and they think that they're good. So, likewise, with, with comics, there's going to be people that are delusional and think they're talented. There's people that are talented but naturally will doubt themselves. But you should go forward. And, but I think that those people will find, whether they find a comedy class or not, those people are going to find. They're going to do the work. They're going to find the open mics. They're going to get up on stage, and they're going to do it over and over and over and over again. And that's pretty much all they need to do in the beginning. Yeah. Learning... The learning technique is, is almost secondary to just getting up at first and just getting that forward momentum. That's what I think. I mean, me coming from it much more freshly than right. is a long time ago for you, but you remember. Uh, no, I, I, so I agree. So that's, that's, that's where I'm coming from. But yeah, if you need a little bit of a motivation, but I think networking, and there's so much information out there. And speaking of, last thing I'll say, is speaking of the voice and the point of view, this is an excellent article. Uh, Kevin Pollack on Laugh Spin mm -hmm. came out about a month or two ago. Uh, a friend of mine, a guy that I know, was the interviewer. And it's the first time anybody went on at length where he really got it. I'm like, yeah, this is what I thought it was, about point of view. And he talks about it. He also talks about a lot of things that are pertinent to stand up and doing it. And it's, it's a really good interview, a very honest interview. And it addresses that more at length than anything I've seen, except for what Elliot and I just did, mm -hmm. which uh, you guys are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Assholes. <laughs> Assholes. Fuck faces. No, I, I agree with you. I think that if you have a lot of disposable income and you do some research and you find some classes that sound okay, then sure, why not do it? Because it'll kickstart you into doing this. You know, um, If you don't have any money, I don't think you need to kill yourself to get a second job to pay for a comedy class. I think you just put the work in. I've always said the best training is doing. There's no better learning there's no better class in the real world just like getting out there and doing it but if you have the time and you have the money and it's not that expensive and especially if you go into the class knowing what to expect if you're not going to be blinded by false promises if you go look look you just say i'm just taking the class to get my ass in gear and i'll hone my skills a little bit but i'm not gonna you know expect them to live up to these promises of being you know discovered and mentioning all the famous people that came out of that yeah. class yeah. or that drop in on that class but if you go if you go into it realistically then i think a comedy class would be a good idea i just i think what we're both agreeing on it's just not a thing where you have to feel like it's absolutely mandatory and like you can't have a career in comedy if you don't take a class like obviously i've never taken a class the overwhelming majority and i haven't confirmed this but i just yeah. know it in my, the overwhelming majority of comics have never taken a comedy yeah. class. I know for sure that Louis C.K., Bill Burr, George Carlin, uh, Chris Rock, Dave Chappelle, Bill Hicks, Sam Kinison, 
clay, you know, Dice Clay, like, they never took a class because they all talked about in great detail in interviews where they were like, they all started when they were like 15, 16. They just went to an open mic and they just started doing it. And there was no internet for those guys. Yeah. There was no YouTube. There were no articles online that they could easily access. They just had vinyl comedy albums of their heroes like yeah. Richard Pryor and George Carlin yeah. and people like that that they listened to or Lenny Bruce or whoever. Yeah. And that's what they had to go. And, and of course, being in clubs, which is like one of the best pieces of advice Elliot got and gave to me. It's yeah. like you have to get out there because you get so used to being with – and not that all people on an op- that are doing an open mic are not professional comics. There's a lot of them that still drop in on that or that are not funny. But you are by and large surrounding yourself with people whose standards are lower, understandably. So you have to get into clubs and see professionals at work or you know go online and watch as many – specials of established people and even a lot of those will kind of suck or, or you'll find to be hacky but yeah. but you have to surround you know just like that anything you're trying to get better at being a tennis player you have to play people that are better than you you have to surround Absolutely. yourself with the best as much as you can and i think for that reason elliot and i are suspicious of well you're learning from this guy who's a booker at a comedy club or maybe runs a comedy yeah. club or runs these classes out of a comedy club have you ever heard of this guy yeah other than these comedy classes, like, no. I, I think it should be a requirement, literally, for, if you teach a class... He should have been on The Tonight Show at least once. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you teach a class, you must allow the class free entry to one show where you perform. And, like, they don't have to pay to see you perform. Just so, go, uh, you guys want to sign up for this class, you all get free tickets, you plus one person, or maybe just one free ticket. Uh, I'm doing a spot, a 10-minute spot on Friday night, or whatever night, come check me out. I think, like... Honestly, what teacher would not do that? If you have, you know, if you have confidence in yourself, like come see me kill. Because you know what? If you can't kill, then you shouldn't be teaching. You know? So yeah, you should be able to audit your teacher. Yeah. I don't know if these guys, all of them, profess to be comics. They just have a comedy school and they teach you about the business. There's probably some things that this one class I'm thinking of that I don't know. Like I don't know a lot of the intricacies of how some of these clubs work. I mean, on a very technical level with scheduling, not like. How does the dynamic of going on a stage and yeah. telling jokes? I get that. Uh, I just mean like, you know, this is like about networking. That's the only thing that is the advantage of like, you're hoping to get in this guy's good graces because he's affiliated with a club or two. Yeah. But the, re- the realistic truth is that you might make it onto, uh, I guess slowly work your way, you might make it onto some other off show of doing bringer shows, but you're not going to go straight from that class into this guy's memory and being booked on any real real show where you're not uh, getting people that have to pay to come see you that you know, like your friends and family getting dragged there, uh, like a bringer show where you can't perform. That's what I should have mentioned earlier. Mm. You can't perform unless you have a certain number of people yeah. there. That's not really, that's not like making it. But yeah. uh, have but, I gone on too much no, of a no, tangent I think, there? I think, no, I think we really cover this thoroughly. So hopefully we've answered any question of anyone who's curious about these comedy classes, um, you know, I, we, I guess we leave it up to you to save your money or spend it. It's totally up to you. But anyway, again, thanks for tuning in. Pete, once again, thanks for giving all your opinions. Um, you're always <laughs> great on the podcast. You always are able to vocalize a lot of things that I want to say. You're my creative cellmate. <laughs> yeah, if you think I'm great, tell Elliot. If you don't think I'm great, don't tell Elliot. <laughs> Fuck you. All right, bitches. But tune in next week, and uh, hopefully Pete will be on again. So this is Pete saying goodbye. Yay, goodbye. All right, bitches. We out.